Hello, everyone. How are you today? Hello, everyone. The link is on this option. Maybe we can a little bit. Okay, so as we are slowly building up, I am posting this and inviting the rest of the world here. Two users. What is the Zoom. They are single. Yeah. Also through the Slack channel, see how the work is going. I'm going to select a random. Hi image. everyone. Hello everyone. Hello Leah. I'm going to select the random image from the the many many like interesting things that are happening, and uh, with that I will share my screen so that they have a. I'm just going to actually add that to the post. who wants to come up raise their hand i see people still like in the in the slack and they're still like preparing so we have five more minutes uh,
if you see uh, either Aldo Solazzo or Sara uh, in the Exactly. I I think you understood what I was saying. It wasn't very clear because I was at the same time posting. Great. Eva, you have like a really interesting uh, virtual background that like flows through you <laughs> and into into the screen. I'm just gonna get some water. So, I see Sarah, so I will bring up Sarah here, and uh, I also see Reinhard Koenig, so I will also get Reinhard Koenig up here. I see Javier, uh, he'll also be up here, and uh, hi Sarah, and thank you for joining us. Oh, hi. Thanks for the invite. And uh, oh, let me also close this window because it might be nice. There's a, there's a guy next door, like it's very actually very, very close. And uh, around this time, he always decides to practice his ukulele. So it, it sounds really weird, like when, you know, when I have like uh, this background ukulele like sound and it's like I'm, some, I'm in some kind of beach and although I wish I would be able to work from home from Greece and like actually be next to the beach with a ukulele this is not happening uh, unfortunately I'm not going to go into details about that because I'm just going to have to shame people publicly <laughs> let's not do that and uh, let me start uh inviting uh let me start like um, kind of like welcoming people so i will give an official introduction to everyone uh in a bit because we need to first gather here so i'll give like a five minute like time to for people to gather i see yeah I see uh, did you say something Elsa? maybe in this five minutes when we wait we can show some videos of the work that they are doing Sure, I mean, but uh, or we could just like wear, wait and like casually chat a little bit. I can as you wish. You can put some in the background, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Oh, but... my <laughs> Change your background, okay. Andy is here. And uh, who else is down there? Hi, Andy, welcome. Morning, everyone. Hello. And uh, well, I'll wait, I'll wait a little bit for Aldo if he may manage. I think he might he might actually join us for the second part of the, of the work. Uh, I will ask. Okay. This is I'll ask the teams to add, to, to join the, the webinar. And I think at some point I will, like, first of all, we are live on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're becoming famous right now as we speak. Uh, these are your 15 minutes of fame. So, you know. Just a bit more than 15 minutes. Yeah, it's going to be like probably a couple of hours of fame, but 
But it also depends on the amount of fame, you know, because I, if I, I can say that probably like, I don't know, like 10 people watching. So it probably, they probably have to be watching for like a good, like 24 hours to, to get the equivalent of the 15 minutes on a, uh, yeah. But anyway, let me uh, switch accounts. Here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Good morning. If anyone arrives and they need to get on the panel because they have to be on the panel, please, uh, please raise your hand. Actually, there's one. Well, there's three people watching on YouTube, so it's it's probably a, f a few a few decades that you have to be talking so to get the equivalent of the 15 minutes on a on a prime time television. So it's just just uh, be patient. We'll be we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, the team. The teams are not all here, as far as I see. Thanks, Nari, for the channel. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the ones that are already here from the teams, can you, like, if your uh, teammates are not up here already, could you please ask them to just, like, everybody join the webinar? And I think that, yeah, we can have a discussion in parallel, like, you're, as you're preparing your, like, final touches to your pre presentations. But uh, it would be great if everybody was there. I see like we have 15 people here, so maybe we're missing people. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Effa is here. I think you're looking for her. I didn't see her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's here. Aldo. Yeah, I can see you as well. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Aldo. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. So anyone else in the attendees that needs to be up here? No. It seems we are about 21. Ah, here you go. There is someone there. Ah, yeah. Luyang, you can join. Yeah, thank you. And I will introduce everyone in a minute. We brought some people here to help us with the feedback. And uh, yeah. Who else is there? No. OK, so maybe I start by describing a little bit like the setup as people join. If, if uh, not because you, I think you're co-host or host, but I can also add the rest ones. Um, 
you can like if you you can screen screen if like anybody comes in and like make them a part. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, first of all, a big big uh, thank you to the teams that I've seen. Like you know, we are all pretty busy, but we've you've done like some really nice work in the past days, and I've been we've been checking the the kind of like Slack channel, and it's. Like yesterday was on fire, <laughs> even till very very late. We had a team dinner last night, so we were like, you know, uh, looking at your like Slack messages as they were appearing, and we were like, you know, really happy that you were like training models and like uh, showing the results. So a a quick note to the whole world, or like to whoever might be watching this or watch this later. Uh, this was the Digital Futures uh, workshop and. Uh, we were invited to do a kind of like free format workshop on AI for urban planning and for resilient urban planning. Let's say we kind of like adapted that to what our main kind of like research goals are. And uh, well, big thank you to Matias Del Campo for the invitation, first of all, and like to all the Digital Futures team because they, they've done an amazing, amazing job like organizing this, this incredible event. And uh, again, big thanks to the people who participated, you've done like really like a lot of work and I, I think it will show. Uh, some of you already had some experience with machine learning. Some of you like never like ever touched anything like that. And you're all like already like talking about models and data and like, you know, playing around with them and which is, which is really, really great. And um, a big, big thanks from my side to the team, like uh, Narid, Yosha, Dielza, Theodore for their like uh, incredible efforts. And uh, yeah, so I have somehow like to introduce also the uh, some people who have uh, kind of like joined us here to give uh, a little bit of feedback on what you've been doing. Uh, first of all, Reinhard Koenig, who is heading the principal scientist project in AI team, is also Professor Bauhaus, uh, who uh, kind of like uh, also leads our team uh, in a way. So hi, Reinhard, uh, you want to say a couple of words from your side? I think you yeah. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to see what you've done in this course. So I've just heard about how great your explorations have been. So I'm really interested to see what you've done. Super. We've also in invited Aldo Solazzo, uh, director of Numena and uh, Global Sum School for IAC and, and other like. Uh, Endeavors, uh, who is also um, uh, very much interested in this topic and works on this topic. So thank you, Aldo, for joining us. We'd be really happy to, to hear some words from your side. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> we've been uh, looking at your, I've been looking at your uh, work and, uh, in uh, CIL since uh, you started. Uh, and I'm very happy that you are also collaborating uh, with us at IAC. Uh, you know, I mean, there is a lot of uh, respect of uh, your uh, your uh, work discipline and also the results that you guys are uh, uh, achieving. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see uh, what you were capable of doing <laughs> in these few hours. Then I will jump to our workshop uh, in uh, like around one hour. So okay, we'll try to forward to see. <laughs> and then uh, I like to also invite like to uh, welcome Sarah Mokhtar from uh, KPF. Uh, she's also done like quite some work uh, also with us and uh, also on her own on machine learning. So she, she's uh, also very interested in this topic. We were all together also in the IAC uh, class, uh, which we uh, we were teaching with Narid and Yosha. So Sarah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for the invite and I've I mean, I've been very interested. So I, I know Angelos and, and Theodor probably a bit longer than everyone else, but, um, and I've been very interested in, in how uh, you approach kind of machine learning computation and um, um, particularly on resilient cities and what uh, CIA Lab has been doing. Um, and what I've seen in the IAC kind of ju uh, jury, I think um, makes me really excited to see what, what happened in the workshop here. So yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Sarah, we, we go way back because uh, we, we, I was teaching her as well at, the, at UCL. So uh, she's, but she's uh, completely gone uh, over uh, uh, since then. But anyway, um, I also want to, to to say hi to Yu Luyang 
uh, she's also joining us, who was actually a student of us in the IR course that we, we all refer to, which was uh, kind of like a very similar uh, work on, on machine learning. So hi, Lu Yang, and thank you for being here. Lu Yang has done like some really cool work on, on our course. So I think it's good to have her feedback as well here. And we'll try to get everybody's you know, opinion afterwards as well as in the panel the discussion. Uh, yeah, hi, Lu Yang, say a couple of words from your side. Hi. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Hi, Lian. Uh, so uh, let's start with the first team. And uh, I hope Parametric Collective has changed their name to something else. Names are names are like uh, extravagant uh, on purpose. So uh, unless you've changed your name, Parametric Collective, can you present? Effie? Unless you want to give your space to someone else. Can you hear us, Effie? Uh, yes, I can start. Is the rest of the team here? Yeah. Is the rest of the team there? Uh, yeah. yeah. OK. How ready are you to present? My screen. You're ready. OK, cool. Um, Super. You could actually, if you if you shared like the the whole screen rather than the than the, the, the window. Yeah, actually, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It looks fine. Okay. Um. So yeah, let's start. Um. We change our name to Urban Collective, like more. Uh, yeah, related to the workshop, and. Um, Let's start. Uh, we will present um, our work that we did these uh, last days. Uh, start uh, in the structure of um, uh, the works, like starting from the problem, the data that we get, uh, the method of um, that we used um, to solve our problem, and then the proposal we we are doing, what we are proposing for our client, who is. Uh, a developer and he came to us and said, hi, I'm a developer and I would like to find the best uh, uh, building site for, to build uh, my hotel. And um, yeah, we discussed with him and uh, to see his needs and um, uh, the parameters that uh, uh, he's thinking to choose the site. It could be the proximity to amenities, the size of the plot, uh, the price. Uh, build conditions, uh, um, site views, energy demands, expansion perspectives, etc. And um, we agreed with uh, him to uh, to look into uh, proximity to amenities, to focus on that and um, create something, a tool uh, customized to his needs. So if anyone from the team wants to jump in and uh, talk, I, I don't have any problem. Um, yeah, we started, uh, we, so we collected urban data uh, from open street maps and we distinguished um, some of uh, the amenities there in the map that uh, he was interested in, uh, like the green spaces, the landmarks, the educational buildings, um, retail buildings, um, transport links and uh, the residential buildings, the rest of the city that he could uh, place um, his hotel. So to, in order to find uh, a place in the city uh, that he could use. And um, yeah, we, we were thinking of using the, the deep Q learning to find this position to learn the site uh, to learn to the site to move in the city and select site um, and based on this diagram the, of our tutors to with the environment that uh, and um, um, an agent that is doing uh, that has a specific state and says he is doing some actions and then evaluating these results and recording these results to learn how to uh, move. We replace the environment with the city of Vienna, a part of it, and um, the site is the agent who has a, uh, a position. 
and um, the actions that it can make is uh, move right uh, uh, front back right and left in the side and um, then uh, he calculates the new he finds the new position calculates the distances that are the um, um, to, to evaluate this position uh, recording um, the results and then learning in this way to move through city and uh, find closer side so we have Yeah, some videos of our training um, um, tries. Yeah, this is the basic have... model. Huh? So mm -hmm. This yeah, is the, the, the yeah. Th this was the basic model. This was the prototype. Like right? you have this kind of boxed environment with all these plots or amenities or, or whatever you wish to call them, mm -hmm. and you see this the agent like just roaming around trying to figure out which plot is the best around this, uh, let's say, center. Maybe the center is something important, some landmark, school, park, what, whatever it is. And he, he's trying to figure out the best spot, the best uh, box of these plots or uh, parameters or what, however you want to co call them, uh, which is the most optimal in uh, all of these cases, like uh, area, distance, maybe it's, there's a price parameter somewhere there, or all of these kind of spatial, thermal, comfort uh, data. Uh, and on the left one, he, he, he just uh, looks at literally according to the center of, uh, or this center plot. And on the on the right hand, uh, he uh, let's let's just imagine he has a drone and he flies so he flies over. He doesn't really respect the the boundaries, but he can observe all of them or uh, four in this case, the four the four best ones which are in in this range. Mm -hmm. So what we really were imagining, but it was a bit heavy to run, uh, was to have this in uh, the city and uh, uh, measure the distances from the different amenities and from the border that the user can uh, give to him. Yeah, but it's and too uh, heavy to run. Yeah. It's running and, uh, on my computer, but he hasn't moved really much since one hour. Yes, I was trying without the uh, result, without the punishment and stuff, and yeah. it was very slow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, we got an intuition on that and how it could be working. And uh, I went back to the client and we proposed an application that uh, oh, <laughs> that uh, he could uh, maybe select a plot or for now have this plot of the, his interest and uh, upload the model, train model or select uh, some options, some uh, race, rate his interest, then train model by himself um, or um, yeah, deploy the model and find uh, the best side. And then he could save his preferences or yeah. Yeah, the, the beauty of this model except especially this sandbox box model it's quite generalized so you can really easily switch the map it, it's not really constrained to to any specific like map or that that was really quite nice because with the vienna model i really just had to switch the boxes with the, the boxes with the real osm data and just rerun it like there is it was quite generalized because the the cost and effect, the cost and rewards, and the punishment functions were pretty much based on the on the curve data and the distances. So it, it's quite a generalized model. So. <laughs> but also, it can be personalized. Afterwards, it could it could uh, offer. Yeah, I could recommend um, based on specific needs that uh, and the user can customize it. So I think it's a benefit. 
Um, this is it for us. Great. Well, thank you, first of all. Thanks. Thank you. Here's a virtual club. Where can I do that? Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, like, uh, I, first of all, as we've said in the first meeting, your idea was quite ambitious, but like a, also a great one. So it would actually make a really great tool. Uh, you actually sell to people if you manage to do this by this week. So uh, from my side, like uh, I would like to hear it from others. Uh, <clears throat> Angelos, are we going to, uh, let me ask a question. No, uh, for, are we going to, we, got, we are going to uh, comment one by one the projects? Yeah, I hope. But, but, okay, yeah. okay. No, I mean, I think in general, uh, if I can make just a general comment, since I also saw the result of your previous uh, courses in, uh, in IAC, um, I mean, I think this is, uh, you starting to define quite an interesting uh, approach uh, to, to connect data in uh, urbanism. Uh, and, you know, it's quite interesting to see how flexible this, uh, uh, this system is to also somehow blend around uh, even different actors that can start to use it. No, in this case, that it was targeting developers, and we saw many, many other different applications. Uh, and I think we're gonna see it also today. Uh, but I guess it's also a little bit, uh, you know, underlining the the potentiality of the potential, no, of using this uh, uh, this methodology uh, that you are uh, implementing. I'm just curious that with the guys to to understand or to have a comment from their side. Uh, regarding the parameters that they are implementing to uh, to decide, you know, which which is the a little bit the um, uh, the, the level uh, how they why why they decide, they decided to go for some parameters rather than others if they believe uh, the system could evolve uh, maybe integrating uh, other components that they are not taking into consideration. I saw that they talk about height, uh, the building, uh, number of floors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm curious to, to hear uh, a little bit uh, comment from their side if they believe uh, something else could support them in the development of this, uh, this tool or, uh, uh, or if they feel they left aside something that could be yeah, implemented we... in the future. We just needed to narrow down these uh, parameters for uh, mm -hmm. the purpose of this uh, workshop and to pick this, this kind of data that we could easily find and measure. Uh, but yeah, we had these other parameters and of course, the, to make a decision, you need to think a lot of uh, yeah, parameters. Um, and um, yeah, we, we were thinking that uh, with this model, we can always add more and more. And um, yeah. Um, yeah. in this case, it we are be, waiting. Yeah. It can become x-dimensional. Like right now, it's not not it's quite limited, but on a couple of basic stuff, like the most obvious stuff that a developer would would ask for. But it can expand to like uh, literally x dimensions. So the but then the system would be much more like uh, he will have he will have much more time to struggle with it, and it's gonna be much more slower and slower to train and to get a, a feasible solution within a normal time, so to say. Can, can you guys go back to these uh, parameters? I'm just uh, curious to see them uh, once again. And, and yeah, I, in any we... okay, okay, go go, say say. We were thinking, for example, is for the side views, the, well, uh, the engine could work and walk and uh, have images of the view that where he is. And uh, maybe with different networks um, uh, uh, implementing uh, there, uh, yeah, to have the mask CNN, for example, and uh, see the percentage of sky or sea or green areas yeah, that he's from seen. that point. And, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, with these um, numbers in later in the training of the DQM, maybe. Interesting. It can evolve and evolve, just like get mapillary data, see the view, see the sky, how much, what do you actually see, and all of that. But but it, just like layers and layers and layers. So. 
Uh, but that's why I found these uh, models uh, quite uh, exciting. Now, I don't want to uh, take over all the comments from the jury, but uh, evidently becomes sort of a modular system of, uh, uh, and it's a process of data fusion that clearly start to uh, underline association at the urban scale of uh, of phenomena that uh, mm -hmm. could start to make sense once they are uh, blend together, no? Uh, and 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 the beauty of this presentation, which is not uh, irrelevant at all, is that mm -hmm. you are also evidently targeting the application to a specific customer, no? That could be uh, then be one of the actors uh, around the, uh, the complex uh, uh, environment of cities. So. Uh, I really want to congratulate you for this uh, uh, consideration that you made. Uh, and it's beautiful to, to see the project that um, you guys presented, even in the few hours that you had at your disposal. That's it. That's it from my side. Yeah, I don't know uh, if, Franco, if you want to, Franco, if you want to present something uh, more, if you... Or... No, I, that, that, that's okay. mostly it. I mean, uh, okay. I, I can show you the, the training of the actual Vienna model, but it's not going to be so fun because it's, it moves really slowly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. We can look at those results later as well. Uh, yeah. It's going to be trained in the next two hours, I saw. I, I, I... <laughs> two hours. Uh, huh? Ambitious Angelos, two hours. Yeah, the next two days, maybe. <laughs> this was a joke, <laughs> clearly. But, uh, uh, anyone else like Sarah and Reinhardt and uh, Luya? Yep. Anybody else wants to have a yep. yeah? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, thank you for the presentation. I I really like the idea that we've created a system that is in kind of space. It's it's easy to understand, but that is kind of expandable that you can use to um, to integrate kind of more complex parameters, um, kind of urban space connectivity and kind of overlay different things question that I that I have which is is about what what do you think is the biggest challenge to make that workable for all different criteria so some some measures of assessment which is like distance um, is, um, if we take it as a kind of a straight line distance between both might be kind of simple to, to get once you start adding kind of routes you start adding topography you start adding um, yeah, I mean, really different yeah. things you start yeah. getting a bit a bit more complex just on the distance um, or proximity um, but then once you add in kind of uh, like layers or, or layers or kind of data that is that goes down just a number so um, kind of uh, how how you see uh, the kind of visibility of something uh, kind of perception of someone from a dis different location or other things um, it becomes a bit more complex so and my question is how how do you see that develop and what, what is the main challenge that you um, expect to to be for this to to, to become usable um, for developers? Well, I guess uh, that we could translate everything to numbers, or at least we need to, or we are going to work uh, somehow to um to measure it um but i think everything uh, with uh, even the side views or something like that can uh, be measured um and uh, then it's nice that uh, i i am envisioning an application for example that um, the car the user can set the preferences and um, you know has the interaction with it and train his own model use his own um, um, yeah, settings and so on. And this can start learning and recommending um, uh, sites that are close to the interest to do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else? Luyang, yes? <laughs> I think this one is very interesting, and it makes me think it can. It's a good mindset to use the to solve the logistic logistic problems because if we have the uh, distribute stations and it 
it's, it can uh, help us to find the dynamic stations. And if we calculate the data from the seller, customer, and the cities, and use the, I think the deep Q learning is the reinforcement uh, learning. So it can uh, train the model uh, through the real time data. And if we collect uh, more data, it will choose, uh, it, it will find the more uh, good dynamic stations for the logistic to solve the, also solve the traffic problems. So this is a very interesting one. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, I can, I can yeah. add just a small, like very, very, very amazing work, what you managed to do in just a very little time. What I like the most is, a bit surprisingly, the non machine learning part. Uh, reinforcement learning is, is very infamous, let's say, for difficult to apply in real life, right? For very good reasons. And I like the fact that, you know, the, a big part of what you did was like, how would the client use it? How would the product, product be like? And uh, because I think if you if you go through that direction first, you can understand and if you move with this forward, maybe as a, as, a, as a case study for yourselves, you can see what things you can do with the agent, what you cannot do, perhaps. So it's, it's a very nice idea that even if this wasn't finished, the, the product view was there for you to understand what data you might need and maybe what would need to be intelligent. So it's very, very good. I like that aspect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I Anyone from uh, uh, from uh, the team, like Nari, Josh, uh, Diaz, do you want to add something, please? Yeah, I just I, I can jump in and say that uh, brilliant application of a, a DQN um, reinforcement learning. One of the three schools of machine learning has found minimal use in the AEC compared to say supervisor on supervised. So this application here is one a tangible thing to apply reinforcement learning something that is viable enough to bring into a product and to bring into industry. I think it's great work that you guys have done. I agree completely. It's great work. It's a great idea as well. Anybody else like Yosha, if anybody else wants to join like and say something, I actually want to also introduce Masa uh, Nikufar, who also a student from our IAC class. And I think it's not gonna be very easy for you to just now comment on this presentation, but you will do that for the next one for sure. And- Yeah, uh, thank you. Hello everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Masa. Anyone else wants to say something from the team? I actually want to I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, uh, which I'm going to ask to every to every team. How easy did you find uh, uh, working with these models uh, through the workflows that were like um, sub, uh, kind of like uh, uh, sub, uh, supported through the, the workflows that we gave you? Like, how easy was it to appropriate these to your problem, and how you know how quickly you could you could do that? Having or not having previous low, low knowledge is also is also an ad, added point you can you can comment on. It's very we, you're very welcome to bash our methods and say this was like crap. It was really so difficult. You are horrible. Like I, I would that would be great feedback. Because that's why we. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was very good organized and very simply explained and. Etc. But um, in this limited time, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time to experiment. But yeah, the way that you present it, and we got an idea of so many different uh, neural networks in those few days was great. Just to clarify, I'm not like I'm not interested in like praising or not praising the workshop in but just the methods. How easy were they to, to be appropriated? And I don't know, Svonko, also you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have I have had like almost sound knowledge of machine learning and stuff, but, uh, but uh, it it really needed a bit of back knowledge to have to know how to properly operate with this stuff but, uh, I mean it's not it's in general it's not something that you grasp in a day like, in general <laughs> yeah, but, maybe uh, some other people that had no yeah, knowledge who had no all. experience can say <laughs> maybe, I don't know the rest of the team 
Um, okay. Oh. Yeah, Michael. Uh, all oh, right, yeah. Um, this is the first um, sort of machine learning project that I've worked on. Um, I've done Python and I've done evolutionary solving in Grasshopper before, but I've never really used the two together. Um, I think in general, one like as a first uh, introduction to it, it was a bit uh, daunting, but as you work through it, and I think uh, thinking of the client problem really helped. Um, thinking of it more as like a pseudo code rather than uh, you know, I've got all of this code and whatnot to fit into. Um, so that approach really helped yeah. me understanding it. And I think in general, breaking down the workshop uh, into different days where we were able to approach it like uh, systematically rather than all at once uh, really helped me as well. So, yeah, I think it was yeah pretty good. Um, Thank you. That's great feedback. I, it's it's really interesting for us to understand. Like that's exactly. I think I think that what that was what Yosha was trying to say. This is exactly why we're doing this. Uh, it's for us to learn how uh, it's how it's how people can interact with these models. So. Thank yeah. you all. We will continue this discussion in a panel, sort of say, at the end. Um, last question about like your your uh, your project. Like, how do you think? How difficult do you think it was to find data to support your problem? And if that was like a bigger or smaller problem. I've many times heard Theodore saying that data is like ninety percent of the of the machine learning process. Yeah. Uh, was that how hard was it to find the data for the problem? Yeah, not much. Uh, not no, so it's, I think not, because I've, it was most of it was obvious data, so not so much, not so hard. Yeah. That's the reason we limited, uh, yeah, our project yeah. to proximity to an amenity so we could easily find to know some data. Yeah, I, I think if we wanted to, to, if the client was asking for something very specific yeah. yeah if we were to overlay more um you know yeah. complex data layers like price per plot um yeah. whatnot, then it would take more it's time but... yeah yeah for example for the price we we're thinking of doing some assumptions uh, with the average that's available or but yeah yeah it all depends on i guess um how complex you want the data to be. But for this yeah. initial model, it was quite easy to do because it was all included within the OSM data. But if we were going for stuff like like last sold price, um, uh, average price of the area, whatnot, it would take us a bit more time. Yeah, a bit more like search for, for those data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so data is gold. Thank you all very much. Let's continue so we have enough time for the rest. Thank you. Uh, great, well done. and. Uh, I would invite Team Kim Beans to present. Again, names are ridiculous. This one, I think, is heavily influenced uh, by one of our members. I'm <laughs> proud of it. You're proud of it, yeah. All right, uh, Kim Beans, can someone present? Uh, you've been working on visualizing massing models from the perspective of the human, pers of the human uh, pers perception, right? Yes, kind of. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think we'll split our presentation in two parts. I'll ask uh, Javier from my team to talk on the problem in general, what we were trying to do. And then I will continue and talk on the process and how everything was done and show you the final results. So Javier, will you be presenting? Uh, I think that is Stefan going to share more, most of the material of the results and then I will introduce the other program. Later on, we will talk about where we are at right now, uh, because we are still training, basically. <laughs> we will be training for a while, I think. Uh, so, um, Stefan, I don't know if, I mean, you can, you can start to share your screen if you want to. Um, can you share your screen, Stefan? Uh, yes. Give me a second. And yeah, we can start from, from okay, this so, slide, for um, example. Our first, I mean, our initial approach was basically how we can make more uh, accessible, transparent, and, and understandable for lay people the way that we picture our company processes. 
uh, because I kind of document some the kind of uh, language that experts that designers use into the into the planning and building design processes are not really accessible or not really easy to understand for regular people, for lay people, for citizens. Uh, so what we wanted to create was a very seamless, seamless uh, method for um, connecting sketches or like a regular way of people of understanding the, uh, the urban environment from a human perspective, from the street level, to be able to picture any other given uh, urban scenery based on realistic street view kind of, kind of images. So basically what we proposed was, okay, can, okay, just to phrase it in a very simple way, can my mother or my grandmother to sketch uh, any other, any even urban environment to get automatically a description, a, a recreation, a simulation of how this urban environment uh, could uh, look like. And this is why what we created was a system which is trained on uh, a street view imagery from Macularry um, and three perspective of a model of a flat uh, three d model of a city for being able to create or to recreate or simulate any other given perspective. I mean, if you look at any street view system, we have like a, we have like particular dots across the street, along the street. But actually, in between, we cannot, we have not that information. So through our system, we are able, with uh, a given number of perspectives, we train our system, able to recreate how would be the outcome of any, any perspective. Are you, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Are you going through the slides or are you stuck at the cover? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I think that now it's not going to show, gonna show the process with the actual, with the actual immediately that we were, that we were using. Okay. So I mean, Stefan, if you want, you can you can start to show it. Yeah. Okay. So basically, our approach was to grab some photos and their coordinates and camera angles from Metallurgy, which is on the right, and try to put it in Grasshopper and Rhino, and uh, catch some three D views in Rhino, matching the photos on Metallurgy, and. Uh, this is basically how our model was trained. So we were grabbing a photo, then creating a 3D environment, teaching model in the reverse order, and then getting some uh, blurry image like this that you see on the right. Uh, so there are some images showing the process. And after the model was trained, we started to put some sketches, colorful sketches, and trying to predict how the city would look like. And this is the image that you see on the right. The image is really blurry and reminds me some watercolors or something like this. Uh, but it still gets the, um, the idea of the sketch, where the ground is, where the sky is, and to, uh, where are the buildings. And this one last sketch was drawn in Photoshop and the image uh, shows like an idea of the city based on this drawing, not a screenshot from Ryanair. Uh, but then we actually were running in a lot of issues during that process. Uh, but then we trained another model so that we could uh, get more a high resolution image out of this blurry one. And the results of this uh, are like this. So this is the final image from our first model. And this is the image uh, which is supposed to be more clear and more high resolution. So our second model produced results like this. like the model is hallucinating on some kind of like we finished this model right before the presentation the training of the model so these results are well i've made them just right now yeah uh, so with how many uh how did you train it can you say that can you explain that a bit uh um, the first model or the second one? The second one. The first one was uh, 
And the second one? Uh, I took uh, high resolution uh, images. Uh, let me show you. Uh, uh, uh. So basically I was taking an image like this, then blurring it in Photoshop to make it look like like this. And this is how the model was trained. So uh, you take the blurry picture and trying to get the uh, unblurred one. Yeah, nice. So this is the results. So this one is blurry, and this is what the model produced. OK. All right. So feedback, anyone? I can ask a question. Yeah. Like, uh, first of all, this is very interesting work, and I like kind of the artistic outputs coming out. <laughs> I'm just curious, how do you think, like, if this was working, right? If you could input some sketches or actual, you know, color, like, let's say, depth maps, and you have real things coming out, how do you expect to use it in, let's say, in practice? How would you use it in your, in your project? So, um, I can take this. Um, we are searching for, from a 3D model. <coughs> One thing that we need to explore with the input of the 3D model is if actually this kind of representation, colorful representation, <coughs> is the most accurate one or the most appropriate one. But as well, if we can train it, I mean, from right, you can create like different kind of viewports. So, for example, uh, we can train as well the model based on uh, on this kind of like a ink drawing, just with the just with the lines of the of the borders of the the 3D, of the 3D shapes, and just checking which would be the best way of training the of training the models. The other issue that we were having, for example, is that the accuracy of the data from mapillary from the from the location of the cameras is not matching exact. Okay, we're trying to do two things. The position of the camera of the UPS camera is not exactly the same uh, as you should ex expect. So there are like some cameras that are fa uh, falling in inside buildings because of the EPS error. So you cannot like align perfectly many times the viewport with the with camera view of the of the mapillary. So it it adds some noise into the into the images. As well the perspective or even the formation of the lenses of the camera as well as some kind of uh, noise for aligning in the right way the 3D model and the and the camera view. So there are, that's why at the end it's very complicated for the for the input uh, for the input data to match exactly the real imagery and the and the and the three model. I don't know if actually using you know, scrapping data as was well as review uh, from the 360 cameras that you can like uh, scrap the whole panorama to be another way of training the of training the system or instead of using the colorful the colorful viewport. Of the three D model of the city, in like more a shadow, a shadow, a shadow uh, model. But basically, at the end, it would be as simple as okay, you have like a, a an input of a sketch showing with lines, or with like some basic uh, basic shading, and then you get and then apply a particular style of the city. So in this case, for New York, right now, training as well for. Paris, for example, I create the output of if it's very different, and then by finding the input sketch and the style of the city, get the recreation, the simulation of that urban environment. Um, that sounds good. Um, I really like the the presentation, the the approach that, that you've taken on kind of multiple steps, taking from an image segmentation, uh, kind of to represent a sketch and then to kind of further refine it, and then just realizing that you don't have to do them in just kind of one go. My first kind of comment or question is: um, I understand this is kind of an artistic approach where you want to create a sketch, um, and that you probably evaluate the results based on just kind of visual inspection, you see that it looks like 
yeah, this is more or less what we want to achieve. Um, I'm wondering whether you thought of other ways of, of uh, kind of comparing or looking at the results to see whether the, the machine learning training is kind of good enough to, for your application or not. Um, and, and if you've looked into why, for instance, it becomes that blurry, whether, uh, what do you think would improve the model? Uh, is it maybe a larger data set? Is it a variety of data set? Is it, um, is it just the approach or the type of, of input that you're inputting in? Um, I mean, just wondering what, what you think you could kind of do to improve the model and how, how do you define what is a good uh, performing model or, or not? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say that uh, we wanted to try different inputs uh, in terms of 3D screenshots, uh, try different colors and so on, uh, and see what would the results be. But in this uh, really intense uh, short time of the workshop, we didn't manage to try different inputs into the model. So uh, to my mind, I would try uh, to go two ways. First, increase the data set for the model as it was trained only on uh, 1,000 images. Uh, probably if we could have 10,000 images, it would produce better results. Uh, and then maybe try different input, uh, trying to change the colors of the screenshots or maybe just uh, uh, get the the, the lines, like the edges of the geometry and so on, maybe train the models uh, on this info and this data set probably would produce better results. Uh, and as for the second part, where we try to make the blurry picture more uh, high resolution, well, uh, this model was trained with 500 images and uh, probably we should increase the data set again. And uh, this would be uh, like a first step to try. Uh, but probably there are some other solutions for this. As for now, I don't see any other ways to probably improve the results of the model. I was thinking as well that we were training the data and as well, we could improve the precision or the granularity of the kind of input output that you were getting and, and even improve the, 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 the results by, by applying like some segmentation in the image. I mean, but even a very basic segmentation uh, through a computer vision model we can get from the street view from the macular images what is a building, what is a vegetation, what is a road surface, or what, that, what is a car. So we can differentiate that. In the same time, uh, from a 3D model, we can differentiate as well that kind of basic uh, classification of shapes, what's a surface, what's a, what's a building, what's, what can be a tree. It takes a which is a valid one. We can apply as well that segmentation to the 3D model image. And as well by applying that kind of like uh, uh, segmentation into the training, not only does the raw uh, image information, but as well the segmentation information, probably we could as well add more precision and more, and more semantic to the, to the output uh, imagery. Okay. And maybe, I mean, it, it builds on what you said on the granularity and kind of precision of the image. Um, did you consider, because I, I feel mo most of the images have the same, I mean, roughly the same scale of kind of buildings to, uh, um, yeah, to, to the kind of the, the output of the image. Um, kind of did you consider looking at maybe zoom ins when you look at when something that is more detailed um, versus things that are a bit kind of uh, an outside view and and having uh, kind of more variety in that sense in the, in the images. I mean, it's a comment, something that you know, to think about now and whether the, um, the size of the image that you kind of use for training um, could have helped or not improve the um, kind of the accuracy or like the learning um, as, I mean, as something to explore as well. Um, yeah. Maybe, sorry, let me make, um, uh, just a comment. 
I have three minutes and then I have to jump to this uh, debate uh, digital future uh, with Ayak. Uh, I'm just, uh, aside from the technicalities, which are extremely interesting to listen to, and now Mascar CNN is starting to blend into sort of a protocol, uh, as your guys are doing, that implements also GAN. Um, I think it's probably interesting to start understanding what do we expect to extract in terms of conclusion from this kind of approaches. No, and what can we learn once uh, uh, the, these uh, virtual uh, scenarios are rebuilt uh, around sort of a machinic understanding of what are public spaces uh, and, uh, and uh, how uh, these uh, neural networks are also understanding and uh, recomposing the different components that are part of this uh, urban environment into a new blend image. So I think there is a lot of room. This is really the beginning. It's the, the total beginning of uh, probably a novel approach uh, that starts also to probably um, merge and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and transform the top-down decision that we are taking as uh, urban planners and uh, really relate probably more to also an automated understanding of you know, our, uh, our cities. So that is something that you guys were presenting as an artistic approach, but I guess uh, there is a lot of, to learn it. Uh, a lot to learn from it. Uh, we did some uh, research with some people uh, in IAC, with some students in IAC, um, trying to connect emotional uh, mapping uh, to um, uh, and, and connecting also uh, people, uh, sensation, etc., uh, in different public spaces and try to merge uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, emotional analytics to also the different uh, environments and start to blend out these uh, will be recreated uh, sort of uh, in a sort of uh, system like that. There are also interesting research from Parolotto uh, connecting um, citizens uh, and understanding and perception of a uh, urban environment. And since, since this is a, a machinic perception of a urban space, uh, I mean, I'm trying to to, to understand where can we build a bridge no? between these two uh, 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 comprehensions, different levels of comprehension of, uh, of our cities. Uh, and I guess, again, um, as uh, it happened for digital fabrication that we started to connect with craft, so we jumped uh, uh, to, to the pre-industrial revolution uh, through the, the last uh, implementation of technologies. I believe that machine learning uh, and this kind of uh, technologies can also start maybe to reconnect to actors that probably are not really participating in, uh, in, the, in the definition of uh, public spaces no? in, uh, in our cities, uh, which is probably something interesting also to start to look at. This is probably a provocation I'm saying, but uh, it's the moment to uh, probably question technology and to art is a pretty good way to do that. Um, and it's absolutely the, the perfect approach to start with, uh, but let's also start to engage with it in, uh, at multiple level, no, on multiple scale. And with that said, uh, I, I need to leave you guys. Um, I see you in another Zoom uh, channel until four. <laughs> thank you for joining, Aldo. Thank you for, for your feedback. Thank you for joining and enjoy the. It's a it's a debate with RIT, right? And like some other people. In it's a debate with all the IAC faculty. We're gonna debate among ourselves about our vision of. Uh, <laughs> aren't you debating? Are you debating? Aren't you debating enough already during the academic meetings? Then you are <laughs> it's an academic meeting online. So it's gonna be a public academic meeting. Academic meeting. Enjoy that. And uh, I, you know, I, I wish I could, but like uh, I, I can't. So. Uh, I'll We're going to also discuss the results of the workshop of robotics and data uh, nice. uh, What time? Uh, it's, uh, I'm in late of one minute, so. Okay. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. 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 Uh, anyone else wants to add something? Narid Yosha Dilza. Yeah, I was actually surprised uh, when I saw this image first, the result. Well, I, I would have expected a, a less good result, actually, because um, the two images, I, I know, I'm not sure if it's clear, but they didn't use mask RCNN for this. So they're quite misaligned, right? And that explains the bur blurriness. So um, for that, I was like, oh, okay, that's more than I thought. That's pretty cool. Also, I really like the fact that you chained up some models, just also as a work process, that this is a possibility you can do. 
And then I guess uh, another step you can, could try is actually, I think Yavi was mentioned it, using mask RCN and to first um, make pix to pix learn uh, to translate from the segmentation mask to a photorealistic image. And then in Grasshopper with the second uh, pix to pix you create the fake segmentation maps in your 3D model and then uh, kind of project the textures on it. That could also be an interesting approach also to compare and uh, yeah, and also combining some different models. But although really cool, I really like your project. Good job, guys. I'm talking to myself. So great, well done. And I think the result is, I mean, it's it's much more difficult to explain how like this blurry image is like a really great result to maybe people who don't, uh, uh, who haven't done this at all, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's very promising as like Yasha said, like, you know, it's a week uh, and you guys have ma managed to, within a week, do really, like, uh, really great. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, how did you, how did you guys find the, the process of, like, you know, appropriating the models to your problems? So, I mean, I have previous experience on using computer vision algorithms. Uh, so I was complete. I mean, I wasn't completely new to that, for sure. Uh, even though I never used like generative approaches into machine learning, and it was the first time that I was applying all those approaches into the Rhino Grasshopper framework, which at some point as well was driving me crazy because I'm using uh, I'm used to use like virtual machines or like instances in the cloud. Um, for me, the process of training at some point was slightly slow here. Uh, so, I mean, for sure there are like some trade-offs, but I'm glad that I'm able as well now to apply machine learning models within, uh, within Grasshopper. Uh, the other thing that it was kind of like frustrating was the data acquisition process because the mapillary wasn't super accurate many times. Okay. Uh, you need to pick and choose. Actually, I, I remember yesterday talking with Stefan and at some point he told me, uh, this is completely misaligned. I mean, you cannot just even, you, even you cannot train with this data. This is, there is no way of doing that, uh, of doing that. So it was kind of frustrating, uh, the, the data, the data acquisition process, uh, because as well, you are dealing with images and it's, they are pretty heavy and it takes time. But, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm glad that I'm able to integrate both workflows from Grasshopper and, and machine learning now. Glad to hear. Uh, anybody wants to add something? Yes, sorry, you said you said something. Yes, and I see something yeah, because yeah. I think this one can make a very good recommend tool. If you uh, first you separate the street view and then train the models, because make, maybe you can separate the street view according to different functions or according to what you want, and you train the model, and you, when you predict this. Uh, the same 3D model, it can give us different options and you can choose which one is the best one. So I think it can create a recommend tools for the urban plan, maybe according to the, uh, you, maybe it's for the tourist or the commercial. So you think separate, separate essentially the, the kind of like images separate. parts? Yes. Yes, separate the uh, street view first and train the model according to the, maybe because you will have the different models and train the same, uh, and predict the same, three, uh, same 3D models. And it will have the different options and you can choose one to use. Any comment, any comment on that, your, your scenario? I am not sure. Like I'm, I'm just thinking like if you separate them, you're gonna get like essentially texture like of, the street the no i i mean uh because if you have the street view if you have many and it's uh, it's uh maybe the location is different and some locations is for the commercial and you pick the commercial areas street view and you train the models i think i think, I think Luyang I, is here i think luyan here is like plugging her project in uh, in this <laughs> Uh, because she did like a, a kind of like a segmentation and like she did, a, she clustered like street view images according to like different urban scenes. So somehow this relates probably to what you've done. Yeah, it could be, 
I think I think we before we kind of suggest anything, like we need to see a more a better trained model, like or like a more more data. Like it's just still early. It's already good enough. Yeah, it's really good. It's good. If I may add something very quickly, I think uh, this project was uh, a great example how to use machine vision to create a data set. And I think in one level after actually understanding the space by using the machine, you can also add another layer of information based on your expertise that you can, for example, separate these, after you separate these features, you can categorize them and then see, okay, uh, how dense that area is, how wide the street is. And then because also in the beginning, you mentioned that you wanted to use uh, use it as an engagement tool for the citizen. So like that's also, that also helps the step uh, to engage with the citizen because they generally may say, okay, I want uh, a space that is more open or I want a space that the buildings have less height. And then categorizing these different features based on the result that you have from what the machine reads uh, from the sketches or in the step that you have the training that could be uh, like the transition from analysis to diagnosis of, of what you are doing in the project. That's on my suggestion for. Okay, great. Okay. One question from the audience. Yeah. I, really love I have a question about color coding of the image on the left. Is it just random to divide different buildings, or is there uh, some rules that you like? Um, there were some rules. <laughs> the buildings were color, co color coded according to their height. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, if anybody from the audience, if anybody else has a question, you can raise your hand also and we can like bring you up here and you can ask the questions you saw. Uh, and thank you for thank you for the question, Mateus. Shall we move on? Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. So next we should have um, microclimate. Uh, team microclimate. Hello. So we were Hi. also trying to figure out, do you want to share your screen or who is yeah, going to do that? I think your microphone is not performing perfectly. What you could do is switch to the microphone of the PC. Can you hear me like this better? Oh yeah, much better. Okay. I, I am the microphone problems guy. So I always like have a problem with microphones. I probably use my ears, I have a problem. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, I always complain about microphones. Okay, so. Uh, All yours. Okay, so uh, we are team building microclimate. We are Edward. Edward, say hi. Where are you? Edward. Oh, hi. And the. Uh, hi everyone. And Eva. Hi everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so uh, the problem we are uh, proposing is um, how to find uh, areas in the urban, uh, in urban areas, and uh, especially in Vienna, where we want to tackle and optimize the macroclimate. And uh, to do that, uh, we know that uh, there are many factors that are affecting the microclimate and uh, which are like, for example, urban floor, urban heat island, the materials we are using for the buildings, uh, the building densities, uh, the vegetations, management, land use, skyview factors. So uh, what we are proposing is to focus on those. So the vegetation, skyview factor and building densities. Uh, the methodology we are proposing, uh, how to find those areas, uh, is first to use uh, satellite images. Uh, and in those satellite, uh, satellite images is uh, to look, locate how much uh, vegetation we, are, we have, how much uh, building, uh, building we have, how much uh, how, uh, street we have. Then from the same, uh, from the same set as, uh, area, 
and uh, from where you took the satellite Im image, so we wanted to take street views, and uh, by using ma uh, mask uh, RC and N to find uh, to find how much sky view factor there is, how much greenery there, there is, the width of the street, the ratio, uh, the height of the buildings, and all all uh, all of those information will help us uh, find location in the city where we want to optimize uh, the microclimate. So this was uh, the big idea, uh, but uh, for now for the workshop. We, we, we focused only on analyzing and extracting uh, the areas, uh, the green areas uh, from satellite images using uh, pix to pix uh, model. So for the data preparation, we, uh, we used uh, from this website uh, uh, the sat satellite images from Vienna, and uh, we took uh, we took uh, pictures from uh, from the sat uh, satellite, and we used data augmentation by rotating uh, several images, and we used Photoshop to uh, to locate green uh, green areas. And uh, so we fed uh, we fed uh, to the model uh, uh, 500 and uh, 500 picture, and uh, we we colored the the input was uh, those, and we colored with Photoshop uh, the greenery. So at the end we can have the the machine when we uh, input uh, any satellite image, it will locate uh, the greeneries in the. Uh, in the urban area. So this was uh, the first step. Uh, the next step we want to do is uh, to locate also the building areas, how much uh, building density we have. Uh, and uh, uh, and then we want to, from the same, for, for example, this area, take street view, views and to locate how much uh, sky view factor we have, uh, the width of the street, height of the building. That will allow us to uh, locate in the urban area uh, which uh, which area wants uh, wants to be optimized by the macroclimate. So this is the workflow, and I will let uh, Edward now show you the model. Okay, thanks. So let me share my screen. Okay. So we've uh, trained the model, as Leo mentioned, and um, so we um, now I just give you a short in, uh, pre presentation of how it works. So if we pick any, so <clears throat> so we took any any other aerial photo and split it up into those tiles, and if we take now, so that's already recognized here. here from a previous run, it took the, that was the input image and it found the, the green areas. And here it gives me the percentage of green pixels. So that's as a rough estimate um, of, uh, to determine how, how green that uh, certain tile of this aerial photo is. And uh, now we'll just uh, pick another image of that set to take maybe this one. Yeah, and it recomputes and gives me the result. So this is basically the image. And here you have also a visual check to see if it's more or less there. And we have some around 6% of green pixels. And let's take another one. Yeah, and here we see we have um, we have a different image with a lot of green, and it depicts the interesting thing. It depicts not only like those known in in GIS, uh, GIS, and so as a, like those public green spaces, but also each and every little uh, little tree or roof terrace things so or greenery here on the roof terrace or here on the tree, and all that greenery is also. At least partly depicted by this uh, by this model, so we can do an an, an analysis to say okay for for that uh, so which which of those tiles fed in if we do it in a batch process uh, um, which of those have the least green space, so we can al already locate which are the most problematic areas of that aerial photo area <laughs> in a larger urban scale uh, where we can start. Uh, taking actions or further analyze um, how, yeah, yeah, how we can improve microclimate uh, issues. Yeah, I think that's it basically from my side. Great. Well, 
Is the, is the presentation yeah. done? I can. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Then I will stop. <laughs> so actually, I uh, no, 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 keep it, keep it up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> great okay. See. Wait. Yeah. I started again. I want to say a couple of things on my side before uh, I ask for comments. Mm -hmm. Like I think, first of all, this is an impressive result. Uh, I believe Thanks. that you've done, you've achieved like a really, a really impressive, uh, like uh, progress within a week and. Uh, MA41, we are working, we're working with them. I think they would be thrilled <laughs> if they saw that, uh, you know, that came out of a one week project. Like, you know, I can imagine like, you know, what, what could happen in a, in a six months project if that's, yeah. if that's like a one week work. Like Leah mentioned, we have some other points in the box, but still <laughs> no time to go into it. Yeah, the thing is that I, and also like, this is part of a, like a bigger uh, process that you, you showed, which was like really, much interesting and I think it's a you know it's a it's a great it's a great result and um, I wanted to ask you like how how different like one thing that I would like to see for example as like as a test is like more on a conceptual level how different is it to just do like a you know color filter on an image and like from that derive the green spaces to like following this machine learning approach where you manually like select yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking of <laughs> about that as well for a couple of last nights, mainly because then <laughs> I had time to think. <laughs> uh, if it's maybe trivial just to take the green pixels and say any Photoshop filter could do this, but uh, it is not because like the model takes into account not only the RGB or or the in this case the G value of the green. So green pixels, yeah. like you would say, like you would do in Photoshop, or as we did the mask, we took the color range of Photoshop, the greenish pixels, and then just uh, pimped them up so they are really green, mm -hmm. green. Uh, but the model itself takes also into the consideration the shape of, of the things we feed in, and also any like like pattern or structure which derives from the pixels. So by going through, because I did some manual cleanup as well from the Photoshop mask, um, I've seen like like a, um, like you say a park, some grass area, has a characteristic that each pixel is still green, but it's a different shade of green. Whereas like a green roof is more or less with a much less variance in this green, greenish uh, you know yeah. range of color. So and I think so for for me personally, that's the power of of, of using a machine learning model compared to using a Photoshop. And one. <laughs> And, and maybe one like, and that's I the reason I'm asking the question is I, I'd like to actually strengthen your point for like doing this and it's like you could also yourself like when because you're manually like uh, labeling these things mm -hmm. so you could label them in a different way so the park is a different label than the tree and the and the, and the roof uh, like green and is is like a different label which then gives you a completely different you know like uh, um, result because you are able to know what kind of like greenery you have by just a satellite image. I think this project has a lot of potential. I'm just gonna not gonna praise myself like the work, like I'd like <laughs> from others to, to say what they can I, can I ask a, sure. a couple of questions? Uh, did you try the model on an image that you know that you didn't have in the data set? I'm imagining these images were part of the data set. Uh, no, no, that's that's actually taken from a different one. So we used like uh, right? yeah we used like the the 35 aerial photo, yeah, this is the one where we trained the data in. So that's all this 35 stuff here going in, yeah. And that's the original one. So those were the image used for, to generate those 470 tiles. Okay. Nice. But then like for testing purpose, we took really uh, the next aerial photo from the map layer showed. So it's a quite a huge, uh, um, yeah. it's a huge area, yeah, and we split it up. So we have now a, a set for testing this yeah. um, and, and, and all those are like, all those images are taken from the 34, uh, 35 slash four. Okay, yeah, uh, that's good to have a... And yeah, so, so it's is, actually, uh, yeah, it's a yes, test. Sorry, please. <laughs> right. Ah, okay, so the other question is, did you compare maybe just a result of curiosity, did you compare like the amount of green pixels in your input images and in the what model predicts. So even in the training data set, you know, I'm just curious to see if the model is finding more than what is there in a way, like as no, you said, you might, some might be missing from, from Photoshop. Right? 
Yeah, there's, I'm not sure you could go through this, uh, this thing like showing you mm. the current for Epoch, yeah. but this basically is the difference of, of, the, of the input and the one which, uh, which got analyzed by the model. Uh, as a result. And maybe if we go down, it's hard because it's constantly refreshing, but somewhere down at, yeah. I think at Epoch 1, we would find some, some uh, not so well. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, know, it, I know what you mean, like different, like areas which weren't in, labeled. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in terms of production, it's good to test it in this way. So like see un, un, unexpected like things. Actually, what I what I realized, I wouldn't take green anymore for finding green. <laughs> I would take more like this, uh, how do you call it, green screen stuff, uh, a color which is completely out of context. Then it would be maybe easier to depict in the resulting image the, the percentage range. Yeah. yeah, that's a learning. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. Uh, I think it's a very good approach, especially also if you continue and you combine it. That would be an interesting yeah. result, I think. Always try to test it for generalization or something else. So mm. testing on different areas of VN is good. VN is very consistent as a city though. So maybe you could try also you know, going to It's not trying to be perfect all around the world, just to see as curiosity how the, how robust it would be you know, with, it, with different. But I think it's a very nice approach, especially if you continue combining it. I'll be very interested to see the results. Thank you. Thanks. I actually think that you guys should continue the work, and I would be like sad if you didn't. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Narid, uh, Yosha, Delza, you want to add something? Or Sara, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, I was, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, that the approach is, I mean, it's quite interesting and um, how you've generated the data set is interesting as well. And I like the fact that you've used data augmentation to improve the, the model and to increase the amount of images that you have and you can train on. Um, I think I have two kind of comments or questions, um, I mean, depending on how you take that. But um, first one is um, you've had to, yes, you've done the filters with identifying the green spaces based on uh, a filter in Photoshop, which allowed you to kind of automate the process. Um, but then I'm sure, so you had to do a lot of manual filtering, which on 500 images could be potentially possible. But once you start to want to expand that, did you try and think of something or a way to automate the process or to make that possible? Um, and because um, once you start adding the layer of, um, what Andres was kind of suggesting of uh, maybe changing the colors of, so a park is different from something else. And then you start kind of adding to the filters that you have in the, in the output image. Um, it becomes a bit more complex to do it kind of automatically and expanding the data set becomes uh, kind of a big problem. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you've considered that and, and thought about it. And this, the second thing is, so on those images, we have a lot of you end up with shadows, um, which kind of probably disturb uh, a bit where you can locate uh, or identify the green spaces, uh, which would have to be in some kind of a manual input on when when you do it on uh, when you create your data set potentially or not. So I I was wondering whether you thought that was a problem in some images or not, or um, how you think on making that work. So, so, so from from the experience we gained was was like a, I mean like a green greenish uh, pixel is uh, as I mentioned before a roof as well. <laughs> so yeah. there's there's no it's just a color and uh, the color doesn't depict uh, exactly what we we need more than just yeah. the color. And that's why I mentioned the shape and and maybe also the pattern which is like uh, taken into consideration in the background. Um, so, so I had to, to clean up manually some parts of it. What was what was good is that, that, that the aerial aerial images are quite large anyway. So and we we split it up. So so this automation was not. So we worked on the whole image and then split it up into those tiles. Um, so we had to do like tile for tile. Um, yeah. Yeah. And. 
I, I think, yeah, you could also do some like pre pre work on the photos themselves. So like to, to get more or less to, to get rid of the shadows. Or maybe you could also use like a model to train it to, to get rid of the shadows. So, uh, but then is, um, there would be, yeah, there would be some point where, where it also like uh, erases um, green shadows where trees are. And so, so that would be something to, would have to investigate how well that works. But you could also use uh, shape finds layers and have them uh, on top of those satellite images. So uh, where we have uh, green areas already defined, like, uh, so we can have them on top of those. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, and uh, for the Photoshop thing, we also automated uh, with uh, the action, action in Photoshop, uh, the process. So it was um, a bit automated. If you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. And the way you created the data set and the augmentation, data augmentation to create the whole set. Um, I think that was probably quite successful and made it a lot, a lot easier. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else wants to? Yeah, Luya. Mm -hmm. Because I analyzed the uh, street view color composition before, and I, I think if you want to automatic analyze the color composition, you can use the uh, K means and don't use the R RGB color mode, use the HSV color mode, and it has the a color view you can set uh, according to the their numbers to separate the colors you can analyze all the different colors according oh, okay. to the hs3 thanks okay. that's a good thank hint you. thanks thank you Luyang. anybody else wants to add something yeah. it's a very good example to apply the models and the methodology was interesting and in the chat, we have also a comment from Sanjay, if he wants to speak up. Yes, yeah, Sanjay. Uh, yeah, uh, so I thought this was a really interesting application. Uh, it kind of gave me an idea where you use uh, near infrared uh, satellite imagery to check the vegetative health because uh, the reflectance of chlorophyll is really well picked up by infrared. And, but that, that data is not available for every location. So if you could kind of uh, relate a known data set of uh, near infrared satellite imagery with your method, you could kind of uh, see what kind of plants and which plants are better, which consume more water and so on, and, and expand that information. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks. Thanks. That's a good idea. For those interested, uh, Sentinel does have that data okay. if you're interested. So it's it's a satellite called SAR. So you can you can try and play around with that. It's quite interesting. Okay, cool. Thanks. I was I was wondering whether you thought of looking at that from the other side. So what if you have kind of a an image um, with absolutely no green, and then you add that, and how you, that generates kind of the satellite image. So on a design, if, if you're talking, if you have a master plan or kind of an urban context of, I mean, it's essentially just doing the opposite, but, um, and you want to see how it would be kind of how this would look in a sense, if you add some greenery, and then you would see how well it would predict kind of the pattern of kind of parks with some trees or like how it would create something that looks more realistic to an urban context that didn't have green, for instance, in the first place. Um, so you yeah. mean as kind of simulation or like a visualization of green space? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Any last comments before we move on. Yeah. Well done, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. I stopped sharing now. Yeah. So. We should have now, next is, Yosha help me on that, like Scale Squad. Hello. Scale Squad, hello Scale Squad. Hi. Thanks, uh, thanks Theodore for the, for the link, by the way, yeah. That's great. 
So, all yours. Can you present yourselves as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we are Scale Squad. Is uh, uh, myself and Nura. Hi. <laughs> and uh, we started uh, for Milan Artem. I don't know if they're here. Uh, the last uh, hours, uh, Nora and I, we pulled through that with a uh, great help from the team. So the idea, so the question that we started off was uh, how to obtain information on building height with the existing data, with data that are not so much related to building heights, but other factors. And then we moved to uh, how to predict the height of a city by training data related to height from a, another similar city. So, and uh, the next question was what kind of data we should uh, obtain. We started uh, by thinking that maybe we can um, incorporate satellite images or um, the footprints, uh, the existing footprints of uh, Vienna, which was uh, our playground. Um, and then we realized that the, the smartest thing to do in the one day that we had was uh, to use only the building footprints and um, the height map from the data that we obtained from um, shape files. So we actually got the data uh, that are already existing and we created the data set, trained the data and uh, the final result within the Grasshopper file that uh, we got from uh, the team. Uh, so we did everything in there. So first thing, uh, preparing the data was uh, just, uh, building plots, the footprint and uh, the height uh, from the shape files that we converted them uh, to the gradient. From there on, uh, within uh, uh, Grasshopper, um, we got our inputs. Uh, our inputs were again the footprints and the height map, and as an output, we wanted to have only the height map. Um, so this is the data set that we made with the footprints being red and the height map the grayscale one. Uh, we trained the data. Uh, of a part of the city. And here are the first results we obtained. Um, so you can see like the comparison, maybe if I go a bit inside, zoom in. So um, so this is what we, we got so first and then with uh, another arrangement, we started uh, taking out specific areas and how they, what is the output there. Um, and ultimately we connected that to the height, uh, the obtained height. And uh, the comparison shows that they don't correlate perfectly. However, what, um, personally I, found, I find interesting, and I don't know about Nora, is not so much the optimization part um, uh, in that case, in the one day that we had, but mainly that it's quite generative and it becomes quite interesting, like what we obtain. So that's it from us. Thank you. That's I don't know if Nora wants to add something that I may have missed. Uh, I just want to add that we were kind of hoping for a better prediction results. We might not have got it, but I think it's mainly due to the limited time that we had and probably we need a larger data set to train the model. But uh, for now, I think uh, it was interesting just to follow through with the process and see what we can get from it. Maybe, yeah, I think I think it's a very nice application. It looks simpler than it really is. This is a very difficult task for the model, so you should be happy with you know. I saw some results that weren't weren't really bad, and of course, the model is going to predict something different. I think 
So this is very difficult because you can imagine what we're giving it, very minimal information, right? It's a smashing and it's trying to predict a variable thing. So I think it's really good. And I like the process where how you generated your data. And most of all, I think I like the fact that you you connected it to the results. So you, you this is sort of exploration and see how does it work in reality. And this is the only way to really see if these things work in a, in a yeah. sense, right? So yeah, I, th I think it's a very good application, and yeah, and and, and it, it has practical implications even when it's not like even if it's not like completely accurate, because it will as long as they give like an approximation, then it will be valuable for areas where we have nothing. So I think it's a very good first step. Yeah, I agree. I really like that you also have the whole workflow from creating your data set to um, training the model and then also um, use it by sliding a, a patch over your area and then also extrude the building. So now we have a real a result basically here. Um, you can further work with in your workflows. I would be curious. I'm not sure. I would kind of expect that maybe the results are more accurate in the middle of your map of the prediction um, then in the sides. I'm not sure if this is the case, but I think there are many ways now you can explore a little bit the quality of the model, try different um, input data types, maybe different um, distances and so on. So with the same workflow, just uh, vary, and vary the, the training data and procedure. So I think that's really cool and a good basis to explore the, um, the model more and probably you will be able to make it more accurate with some more time. Some, uh, very nice. And just a question on to the showing the entire workflow. Uh, I really enjoyed how you actually validated it at the end, you know, compared your results to the actual existing. And that last slide there was quite poignant and it really showed to us. So I think that was great. Yeah. We have Thank you. Question. Oh. Go ahead, Sarah. That's fine. <laughs> Go for Okay, I had one question regarding uh, the minimum and maximum values of the range of the heights that you train the model based on. Like, I was also experimenting with uh, building heights, and then like when I tried it on different areas, the range of the values that you have is different. So if you try the same algorithm on a different area, the range of the grayscale that you have is going to be different. And then how do you manage to, uh, it's like a challenge for this step. So how do you manage this challenge? And uh, so like the boundary of the city or the area that you define to train this model on, uh, because you also mentioned that, for example, you want to use it for another city. So the range of the building heights, for example, in Barcelona is very different from New York. So how do you want to like customize this process of workflow uh, to be able to use it for different cities? I think it is uh, very important, first, the typology. I uh, like um, that we look at the typology at the footprint. So it's uh, very important to not look, I think, about the team can uh, or Nurek can, uh, can uh, say something else. But I think that in terms of the typology, the form is very important in which city you're going. So if I could obtain data, like if I want it for Athens, I may go to Istanbul or I may go to Lebanon, I don't know, but to cities that may have the data and I don't know if they have them, but they are quite similar in their typologies. Uh, but in, in terms of the height, uh, we use not dynamic range. We use, um, we saw which is a range in uh, Vienna that was zero to 50. And so it was a stable range because if we did have the dynamic, yeah, we would have uh, a problem, I guess. I think uh, it really goes back to the variation of the data set that you will be using. The more you train the model into various cities, various topologies, the more it will be able like to make that correlation between the topology and the shape of the building and the probable height of it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. but I, yeah, I, I agree that the, I really like the workflow and kind of the idea of, because that's something that you probably need. So it's easier to find outlines of a city and then finding heights for some reason data is, is usually less accessible if you 
let's say you have different cities of different kind of um, densities, um, I think it's it's a kind of valid uh, question to ask and uh, to try and and predict that the heights. And I really like that um, we're looking at three dimensional data and trying to yes, we're converting them to a two D representation. But I find that in general particularly hard to get. And, and in that case, they're height maps, but once you start adding more complexity and, and building from a 3D geometry to uh, learning it back and putting it back to a 3D representation, I think is, um, is quite interesting. Um, on the point of maximum kind of maximum heights, kind of a fixed value would work, but as you, as you probably mentioned, so what if you want this model to work for everywhere in the world, you could, I mean, there's a maximum height of buildings uh, that you can use, but then you dilute the, the differences between the different heights. So let's say if you're using a maximum of 400 meters um, for all the images and then the maximum height in, in, in this specific city is 50, then the kind of the differences in, in colors that you see in the image are much less. Um, and the training is probably um, a bit harder to get. So making something more generalizable does not necessarily make it a bit, I mean, you might need more data uh, representations from everywhere. So, I mean, potentially that could be possible since, I mean, height is something that you have kind of a maximum of. Uh, in other cases where this is a bit more uh, less known or like variations are not very controlled, um, that would be harder to, uh, to kind of generalize or fix. But um, that's kind of a common, I mean, generally, I think the approach is, is, is interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Just maybe a general comment on this on this discussion of generalization. It's really important to be able to generalize out of your data, obviously, but it's also important not to remember that this kind of thing, like here, urban urban is urban urban approaches on the urban real, they can also be specific. So like since they are geographic. You can take advantage of geography and you could train a model for a specific city, right? So it doesn't mean that your model needs to generalize across all cities. You could train for a specific city and then try to test it and refine it on a similar type of city. So it, it, that's also an approach. So it's not always uh, endless, let's say, pursuit of data. So it's, a, it's just a, an idea that you could use. Anyone else wants to join? We want to add something, something from the audience. Maybe uh, there's a there's a question about the heights. Uh, what was that? I think yeah, so. The question it. was if it was absolute heights, but I think we answered this right. The heights were zero to fifty, and they were the absolute heights of the buildings. Correct in the height maps. Yeah. Okay. Oh, someone like someone. Yeah. Someone ah, okay, like, okay. I just, yeah, I'm not sure who this is. Uh, I mean, I think I actually think it's a very it's a very ambitious project, and uh, from the beginning I was a bit like skeptical on whether you're gonna achieve uh, something. But I think that again, it's very early to see the to, to understand like you know the, the usefulness, that you know the the kind of like the the um, uh, let's say a performance of the models, the results. But if you manage to do that, that's like a really great. A really great uh, tool for for a lot of us. Like the, I, I can't even uh, remember the amount of times I was like trying to find a model <laughs> that was uh, you know we we theater have done that like so much. We really like even if it's not like extremely accurate, it's getting a, a an idea would be yeah it's a very very useful thing because you get like a much more like um, detailed massing uh, of, of a city and you can do a lot of things with those models. I think you should continue. Yeah, we should. And you had some ideas about like adding different things, like for example, the shadows or other things like, you know, that we, we talked about and maybe I'm, I'm feeling a bit bad that maybe I pushed you in the wrong direction at some point, uh, but because uh, there's many things, many other things that you can be doing here to, to, to you know, help the model perform better. Yeah, exactly. We kind of drifted from the original idea, which is like trying to maybe get a direction about the height from the shadows. But 
because it's a more complicated problem and you have to take into account uh, various geographical area, various sun degrees and etc. Exactly. So this was kind of more simplified approach. It is very possible though that you can like that the that you could somehow get the shadows out of the models with a one pass uh, um, kind of like machine learning process. So essentially train the model to learn what are shadows on the satellite image, just purely what is shadows and what's not, like so like, like segmented according to that. And then irrespectively of where in the world you are, like feed that model uh, to, to a height model, but you would probably need, like you need other layers, I think as well. You need like more than one models to achieve exactly. that, probably. So the shadows can validate the heights, the result heights or uh, vice versa. Yeah, they can feed into each other. Uh, there is someone in our team that's not like actually anymore in AIT, but was doing a PhD uh, who was uh, trying to, let's say correlate the 3D model like the, the the actual 3d um maybe depth depth images of, of a city with uh, certain characteristics of you know the, of the of the quality of the urban space and he was trying to source 3d models um and uh, it was impossible to to actually find again like you know 3d models of, of you know a lot of a lot of the Muslim cities and he essentially somehow managed to hack the the Google Earth uh, uh, rendering engine and like sh got got the the models out of that, uh, and that's it was a different a different approach. But it's also like it just to me it shows that like there's a lot there's a lot of need for that. So yeah, I mean if you if you decide to continue, uh, I would be very happy to see the results. There's a lot more work to be done there. I think. I have a question regarding that. Like if we uh, uh, get many more inputs. For example, if we did get the the shades of a very specific uh, day and time uh, for Vienna for the 3D model that we have already, or uh, the information that we already have from the shade file. So, if we had as the input the the shadow as well, <clears throat> does this affect a lot the outcome? Does it become <clears throat> much more accurate uh, in your experience? Really? It's hard to say because I think the shadows and the density are also not really clear to see for the model. I think in any case, it's super uh, interesting to think of the input image to show the model what, if it's able to predict the height of buildings from just the footprints, it means also that the information is somehow encoded in just the footprints, which is also worth to think of, is that the case? Can the model make this relation? Because uh, maybe it does not have the necessary information to to draw this conclusion because there is no stable relation between footprints and, and building heights. Now we have a higher, um, you already have like not only one building, but the blocks. So maybe there's some information the model can capture, which is not so obvious for humans. But yeah. um, shadows would be like one additional um, data point the model can learn on. And and there could be there could be also other uh, other things that appear in a satellite image that are uh, let's say relevant. And uh, it could be, for example, I don't know, um, how clear uh, things are on roofs of things. But I think that's an, like a long shot, but it, like it's, it could be what kind of features exist on a roof. So if it's like a, let's say a tiled roof or not, or like a, a flat roof or whatever, like that, that's also something that can be, can be used. But also, again, it, re it really depends on the level of, of accuracy you want to achieve. And I think the more amount of data you have, the more you would understand these correlations. So like, in a way you have to run many, many of these experiments over like, you know, months to understand like the correlations so that then you say, okay, what I really need is the shadows. The only thing that helps me is the shadows or what I need is, you know, the, exactly. the, color, the color kind of like of you know, the roofs or whatever. To, to, to increase that feature so that you get a more direct correlation between the input and the output. But yeah, I mean, again, this is, you started doing that on Monday, so it's Friday. So I'd say this is a great result. We should never forget 
that you guys started with these things on Monday, like yeah. generally, and you also had to put a team together. So generally, like yeah, Lu Yang says HSV. Would you like to explain this comment? Well, you dropped that there, so he, you have. So to. sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. you're talking to someone else, or like it's it's okay. Uh, if you want to explain, it's it's fine. Or otherwise. Okay, no worries. Uh, so, should we go to the like next team or uh, any other questions for this team? People are getting slightly tired. I think we need some we need some like some cheering up uh, moment. Uh, so, some champagne maybe for the projects. <laughs> no, we should go to the next team. So, ah. Uh, thanks, Nari, for that. Sarin, you're here. And I would like to welcome you as well. Sarin is another student of this uh, group uh, that we taught uh, in IAC. And I'm really happy to have all of you here because if you've been, you've gone through this hell and then you can help other people, other people like, you know, <laughs> as, they have the, as, they, as they follow the same path. So thank you, Sarin, for joining. Is also seeing you here or not? No, I think she was watching on YouTube, but anyway. Cool. Uh, next team is... Special Analysis. Special, special analysis. Special, special analysis. Uh, special, specials. Uh, can I have special, specials uh, presenting? Yeah, sure. Team Special Analysis. Uh, we're here. I... There's enough people in the in my in my Zoom, so I don't know who's talking. So okay, uh, Anderson. Hi, Anderson. I saw you. I spotted you. Yeah, you can share your screen. Sure. Um... Can you guys see this? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. I'll, uh, go this way. Okay. So, uh, we're team spatial analysis. Uh, the structure of our presentation is basically uh, to show you guys our initial thoughts and describe our problem, the kind of data we had, and our method, the results, and then a discussion on how to improve uh, our results. Uh, so uh, our initial thoughts were based on this uh, view on complexity, on complex systems that states... Uh, uh, that there is some sort of unbehaves in a complex way because uh, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't matter how noisy all the information that uh, is pertinent to a, a system, it doesn't matter how noisy it is, but, but due to entropy and the evolution of, of that system, including cities, uh, everything tends to organize itself uh, in a very self-organized way. So we can see that behavior in cities uh, when we uh, look at this uh, picture on the, on the left in which we see how uh, urban density correlates to transport related energy consumption. So the way people uh, uh, move from point A to point B has something to do with how uh, buildings uh, stick together and how high they are and stuff like that. And um, it, it, to describe density is also something that is not that simple because there's many different categories on, on density. For instance, how many times you can go up in a building, uh, how many times the, the floor area of the lot can you use to uh, make that building and how much of that area it, uh, it is, is uh, occupied by that building, and also uh, how much 
uh, network length you have per certain unit of area. So how, how much dense the streets are. Everything in this other uh, work here, which is space matrix by Pond and Help, uh, showed us uh, how all these different aspects of density are related to uh, buildings, typologies, and transportation, and all other urban elements that define this complexity in a city. So we thought that maybe we could Edison, uh, use... Uh, sorry, can I just interrupt? I, I think sure. uh, we're not seeing the, the full screen presentation. It's okay. still on the cover image. Okay, I'll, no I'll stop sharing this screen and, and the one with the with the full screen information. Sorry. Uh, can you see this now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. So this is our initial structure, the two images I was talking about. So we, we, here we, we, we can see uh, uh, a power law indicating the correlation between density and energy use in, in transport related uh, issues. So uh, you see that the more dense a city is, less energy it consumes and vice versa. And it, all the points are very well explained by this uh, power law. And this is a typology related uh, graph uh, with all the information on these different kinds of density, uh, as I was explaining. So we thought about uh, training uh, a machine learning algorithm to transfer that planning knowledge from real cities in order to uh, predict uh, building heights, right? So can we predict building heights or density given a block's urban elements based on a model city? And it, uh, uh, that's, that, that, would be the, um, that would be the pitch we uh, stuck to from the beginning. So our data set is basically uh, building geometry, the city shape, and all this uh, metadata uh, regarding other urban elements and encoding all that information in, uh, in colors so that a composite data set would be shown in a color map to train um, a GAN model. So the data preparation is basically geodata you guys provided us uh, and uh, to encode that data with uh, colors in different layers and create a, a pair of images uh, in which we had the image with layers of information removed. The one the, the, the information that was removed would, uh, would be the information we wanted the algorithm to, uh, to make an estimation, to make a prediction. And then the, the second image for the training would be an image with all that information. So it would be a supervised learning model. Uh, and then we would test the model with custom user input and OSM data. I think Sanjay could uh, give us a, another explanation on that, a better explanation on this testing the model thing. So uh, to test the model, we have Unfortunately, I didn't save any information that the machine hadn't already seen, uh, and it would be nice to create our own images, uh, our own shapes of buildings and so on, and also to check uh, existing geometry from other cities. So the example we took was uh, footprints from London, uh, and uh, that's, that's how we tried to test the model. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh... This is uh, an illustration of the previous slide. So on the left, we have uh, the first image, which is uh, all the elements minus the information on building heights. And on the right, the uh, correct answer the machine would have to predict. And then I think Sanjay can explain uh, a bit more about the, the whole procedure on our method. I'll stop sharing my screen. Can you 
you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, So this was uh, basically different tiles that we uh, looked around the, the playground model to create our training data. And uh, just to give a quick uh, experience of what, what happened during the training. So uh, I created two training sets or two, train, uh, model, two training models. Uh, the first one was just with 400 images with not much of overlaps or uh, variation. And this was completed in 30 minutes, but then with some really good input from the team, uh, we were suggested to add more variation into our data and that we could have overlapping images, uh, rotate the camera and so on. Uh, so the final uh, model was trained on uh, 100 different sections of the study area with four orientations uh, of the camera. And we moved the camera positions in six different locations around uh, the, the main uh, grid points and that resulted in around 2,400 images to train and this took around seven hours of total time in training. Uh, the method that we had for testing, so the we had two methods. The first one is where you could just draw your own uh, uh, information and then the model would try and predict what the heights should be. And the second one was just take OSM data and uh, try and predict the heights from that. So in the first one, uh, I think just to see the difference between the two models, between the model which was trained on 400 images and 2,400 images, uh, there's a lot more definition uh, or you can make more correlation between the input. So what I noticed and I didn't test this with many examples, but uh, if you just look at the image, the model trained with more images, you can kind of see an increased uh, density around the points of interest that's shown with the purple gradient. And uh, I thought that was interesting. It might just be a fluke, uh, but then we, for the second result that uh, we observed uh, when we supply it with OSM data, uh, it tries and makes a prediction on, on heights. Uh, and this is what we tried looking at for comparison of the actual heights in that area. Uh, couldn't really make any correlation because it's still too noisy. And I'm just gonna show you a quick uh, demonstration of how that looks. So this is the setup in Grasshopper where we put the different layers of information and color coded everything. And to test it out, uh, we can start with just the user drawn layers. Uh, and if I just go into buildings and draw a shape. It should draw it here. And then when we click this button, oh, sorry. It tries and predicts the heights over here. And we can switch to OSM as well and uh, just move around different places in London and try and predict the heights there as well. Uh, and uh, we didn't really have enough time to look at what is, what are the correlations. Uh, I think uh, one main aspect that we kind of missed out is the potential of the machine learning algorithm itself and what are its sensitivities. Uh, and I think that would be a good exercise to go into and understand that a little bit more. Uh, but one general uh, uh, observation that I had is, even though we had all of these layers of different information uh, combined into the input image, you could pretty much take off the street networks or even the, uh, uh, the, the point of uh, the bus stops and you would still get more or less the same kind of result. So I think this is because it, the, the algorithm hasn't seen enough of this information to draw a connection between the two. So yeah. Addison, do you want to speak a little bit more about what ideas we have to go ahead? Yes. Uh, you stopped at slide number, what was that? What next steps, okay. Number 17. Yeah. Amazing. So, 
You guys can see my screen? Yep. So yes. we thought about um, in the next steps in order to uh, make our results a bit better, adding more diverse training data in regards to all these parameters we were trying to correlate, you know, density, building shapes, urban elements, everything. Because we can see from the first uh, graph in our initial thoughts that the difference between uh, urban shape was not even contained within the single city. We're seeing this very meaningful curve along totally different cities, right? So we have from American cities all the way up to uh, Asian cities and so definitely we, we think uh, that adding more diverse training data would be healthy for our process. Uh, so also developing a more nuanced approach uh, beyond just the, the image-based uh, models, maybe applying some sort of, of uh, indicators, you know, a weighted scoring system on urban elements, and the use of the uh, metrics we, uh, I presented in the first slide uh, on, on space matrix, you know, correlating all these uh, uh, factors to uh, more specific uh, density measurements. And so that would also uh, give us a more uh, robust amount of features to train the model. Um, and, and another possibility would be to uh, the, the inverse of what we accomplished here would be the generation of urban elements given a certain density, which would even make more sense, right? So we have the buildings already. So how can we, uh, uh, how can we implement all this infrastructure, all these uh, urban elements around surrounding these buildings in order to make this city make more sense, right? So that's pretty much it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Great. Thank you indeed. I mean, really great and very well presented as well. Very, yeah, very kind of like thorough. Uh, who wants to start? Sarah, maybe because you have to also yeah. leave at some point. Uh, OK, yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I think the approach is, but so correlating different, so density with trans transport, I think is is uh, quite an interesting thing to kind of find a correlation for, at least from a map to, and I like that you started with data that might not necessarily kind of, they're not really related to, um, I mean, they're related to geometry, but I think what's interesting here is that you, you're removing layers of, of data and then predicting them. You're not just predicting one correlation between one element and the other. You're predicting kind of a, uh, a multitude of data together and kind of their combination and, and how uh, that helps you predict uh, something else. So I think in, in that sense, uh, how you combine them in one uh, kind of input output layer, I think is, is quite interesting. Um, and I, I mean, I see a lot of potential in terms of applications of how how you can take that further. So I kind of commend you on on that. And I, it's I think because the, the reason why it's harder to kind of start correlating is because you, the more kind of com the more data layers that you add, um, the harder it is probably to train and to find uh, a correlation that makes sense. Uh, so it's probably yeah, with more training data. Um, I can see that working um, a lot better. And definitely the present kind of building on what Ang just said, the presentation is uh, particularly well um, kind of presented and, and very kind of to the, to the point. And um, as I, I, something I comment I made in kind of the yeah, kind of jury presentation, but um, it's, it's always hard to, to take something that is a bit more complex. So like the technicalities of machine learning of kind of in, input output, uh, images and how to make sense for that from a designer perspective, from an urban perspective, how to visualize that properly and how to make sense of that, I think is is something sometimes overlooked, but that is that without that, you can't really make um, that usable for any designer or for any urban planner or for any, for any real application. So 
Uh, I think that was great. Yeah, that's. Thank you. I'd like to actually add a comment here, like that. Uh, what, like, it, your presentation made me think, think a lot about, like, uh, something that also the the presentation of Team Microclimate made me think about. Uh, so, so we are like trying to figure out so problems of of the urban uh, of the urban uh, uh, kind of like fabric and like you know like problems in relate to the climate or relate to like the use of transportation in this case or like you know. Um, but you, what you both have done is, so we are lacking data. Like we don't have enough data about our cities, right? We have a lot of data, for example, what we do on our phones through social media or whatever, but we don't have enough data about our cities. What you both are doing is essentially producing data by machine learning. Like so you're, using, you're using machine learning to actually produce more data than, than we have access to, which is a fantastic concept if you think about it. Because like you're trying to produce you know, what is the density of a certain area in a city without me having, you know, any detailed information from the government or anybody else about, you know, what is, you know, the amount of people that are there, like, what, you know, what are the heights of the buildings based on, like, the transportation use? What is the, you know, the, and I think three different groups, like also previous one, like, where you're trying to produce data that doesn't exist, which is then a very important part for the machine learning. Or you know, produce. If you produce all of these layers of data, then you, in an like accurate enough way, then you have even more data to to analyze the city. So like, it's actually it's very interesting. I don't know. Maybe I'm 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 gonna leave here, but like uh, uh, Theodore and uh, Narid and Yosha, help me out. <laughs> That's a good point. I like what I what what I like a lot about this uh, this project is. This, that it is grounded on this sort of research, right, and understanding of what you're trying to achieve. So you have a prior, you know, that you're embedding into the pro into the project. And in fact, most of the most of the most of the useful applications of machine learning out there, they are based on very, very, very let's say heavy priors. You know, a lot of domain knowledge. They're not really what we see in the media. This unsupervised model generating amazing things they're usually based on engineering on knowledge domain knowledge so so i would i would highly recommend you to look into the direction of this prior that you see in the world right how can it help you predict better uh, results the, the fact that you know this relationship between density and cities that's one thing that i, I think I, I could think of the other thing like we discussed with uh, many of the teams about how to teach how to teach a model in a way in a stepwise manner right you're giving like either easier tasks or a diversity of tasks in a curriculum learning, your, your setup is really nice for it because you have these different layers. So instead, you know, you can think of many multiple pairs there going from different input layer to different output layer and kind of like sort of building up a model that can predict throughout this layer. So this curriculum learning, it would, I think it might be an interesting thing also to, to look into. And yeah, always, and Again, the last one based on this prior and this knowledge, when you were saying that to turn it into a top-down design, which I like a lot, like can I generate density, uh, shape, morphology out of density, since my model knows how to uh, quant quantify density out of morphology, is a top-down, like it's turning the model to a top-down design, which is really nice. It can be potentially very helpful in, in practice, right? But you can, you can also help to do it through these priors that you know. So as you said, you can you can calculate some metrics and pass it as a class. So this is, and there are many GAN models. Not sure if Pix could be the best for it, but there are many other GAN models as well that can take this information. They can be conditioned by this, you know? So I think, yeah, it's a very good approach in a good direction. So you use this prior and this knowledge where you base it to improve it further. I would like maybe to add to this comment on you that you generate more data with the model. I think it also can generate some insights for, for us. And I think you made this optimization with your first train model that, oh, it seems like fix to fix allocates a lot of density to public transport stops. Maybe this is on the obvious side of things, but still this is kind of an optimization. Uh, this is what the model made sense of. The model made this sense just out of the morphological uh, configuration of that space. And maybe there are um, other insights you can extract from from what the model implicitly um, made relation of between just this uh, morphological configuration of a place, and then how it allocates mass, or maybe transit stops, or other things. Yeah. 
Thank you. And what I would like also to say is that I really like the example of and all the complexity that it's uh, tackled because it's somehow tightly related with the principles of design theory and the principles of Le Corbusier, so to say, with the street network and the density of the buildings and also the correlations how dance should a neighborhood be. And I really think that it's a good case that you generate data on it and that you have two different locations where you apply it and see the difference and where it performs different and understood it better. And I need to say that I miss the paint part in this approach. <laughs> you have paint for doing the manual changes in images, <laughs> but it's still very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, also very complete workflow again, I think, from data generation, many, many ideas inside of how we can proceed and then also to uh, have different way of testing your models uh, interactively. It's really nice. Thanks. Very welcome. Impressive indeed, yeah. Who else wants to add something from the audience? Anybody from the audience? Can that... I go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting work, and uh, I suggest that, like, because morphological uh, density and population density is highly uh, correlated, uh, if you try this also with the cities that you have access to the population data, because usually it's one of the easiest data layers that we as urban planners and designers have access to, and then you can see that how you can train your model and then find out the relation between population and density and morphological density and then also try it into uh, urban areas that uh, the city does not have uh, access to easily for example the urban slums or uh, these kind of risk areas that we have in the city and then you can uh, use this methodology to somehow have an understanding of those specific risk areas in the city that could be the, a use case that I could imagine for, for, for this methodology. Thank you. Sarin, you want to add something? Lu Yang, anybody else? Um, I, I wanted to add, I, I'm not sure if um, we have access to building heights data in London because I know that we have that in Barcelona. Uh, I would, I, I think it would have been very interesting to compare the actual data of the building height with what you, what, what you guys have tried to, to find with the, with, the avail with, the, with the machine learning tools, just to see how accurate, uh, I would say, um, the results could give you. Like always compare the manual work and the machine learning just to see to what extent machine learning can can help us humans to to predict uh, results. I think uh, that's a really good point. Uh, I did try comparing it to uh, the, the building heights in London. Uh, there, there was one uh, data source. And uh, I think the, the problem that we faced is I'm not sure if the scale of the training data uh, affects how it looks at density. So one of the variations that wasn't added is just zooming out and zooming in. Uh, so if I was to zoom out of uh, the London data set, it would predict a different density. And if I zoom in, it predicts a different density. So I think that's, that's also another interesting thing to look at. Yes, we have faced the same issue. We had different scales when we had class with uh, Angelos. So a smaller scale uh, when we zoomed into a neighborhood scale it gives uh, it gave us different data than when we zoomed out to the city scale so yeah that would be also nice to see how what what are the differences what is the factor that gives us different results in different scales maybe, maybe working, working with the uh, with those indicators on on um, how we measure density regarding to the the the, the area of the lot so that numerical information would solve this issue right instead of looking just at images so that the scale wouldn't interfere as much in a negative way in a, uh, in a you know, as if, as if the images would be lying to us, that wouldn't occur. Land use maybe also could be an important input because like if you know that's, that, that's gonna help you to define those ratios as well. Right. right.
Okay. Anybody else wants to add anything else? I think we are ready to conclude. I, I would like you to share with us this presentation because uh, it's really, really uh, nice the way you, you, you put it together and like really shows a, a concise project for this for this week and everybody else to, sh to, to share their content on the drive if possible. Now, I, I'd like to ask you to like, uh, yeah, close the presentation and what we can do is uh, we we have uh, uh, designed this as an as an open discussion afterwards. So we want to actually have a chat with all of you. But we first need uh, to do two things. One is uh, we will launch a poll about like how you know nice or bad this experience has been. It's got a few key questions on which we can also focus afterwards. Uh, during the discussion. So I'm going to launch the poll now and I'm going to leave five minutes uh, to everyone to like, you know, catch a breath and like, you know, get their coffee or whatever they need to do. Uh, oh, nice. How nice or great, how great it was. Yeah, uh, from, I, will, I, will, I will do like a summary afterwards from, from, uh, from my side as well. Like, I think I'm, I'm really happy with, with what I've seen. So this is the poll. Please uh, be as blunt and uh, we don't know. I will. I will. We don't know who you are. It doesn't matter. No, actually, we do. Not you, Theodore. Not you. Not you, Theodore. Ah, I cannot vote. That's that's. I see host, host panelists. Huh? Wait, wait, wait. Actually, sorry, one second. Relaunch polling, ah. and now you can all participate. Sorry about that. Like I had. Ah. I launched it also only to the attendees, and uh, that was not. Uh... Just while you vote, I'm gonna have. Unfortunately, in two minutes. So I just wanted to yeah. uh, first thank you all for the great presentations, and it was, um, I mean, it's great to see that you could achieve that within I don't know half, four day, five days of yeah. of just even kind of starting from scratch, building a database, training, and getting results, and making sense of them, and testing different things, things that would typically take, I mean, definitely not a week. Uh, so I think that's. That's very impressive, and everyone took kind of very different approaches to that. So that was very interesting to see. Um, so yeah, so thank you for inviting me here, and um, I'm gonna have to leave. But yeah. But thank you for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, everyone else can give a few minutes to vote. Let's see what's going on. Screen sharing now. Fireworks going on. Yeah, it's not bad. I couldn't be getting like diverse. Yeah. Great. Best animations. <laughs> Again, you can be as blunt as you want and as like you know uh, critical as you want here. This is uh, this is actually a good feedback for us. We're missing a lot of people, so we're waiting for the vote. Uh, giving Let's like take a break, we said we're taking a few minutes break. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'll just keep talking because I, I like the voice of my of my own self. <laughs> keep talking, <laughs> make a break. <laughs> uh, I'll just, just keep five talking. minutes, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. just entertaining the the the, the really big oh. huge crowd of three people are watching. Wait. <laughs> okay. Stay there forever. You know, I always wanted to be like a comedian. Uh, but yeah, it's eight people watching. I mean, this is, I got my audience. So guys, could we, would, it, would there be a designated uh, folder where we can put uh, and share definitions? Yeah. Because that would be nice to see other workflows yeah. and see what 100%. Uh, could be changed or yeah. Can we more? I will set that up right now and send it over in the Slack. Because okay. it actually would be great if you can if you can share everything there. Uh, we could use the CIL drive as well, like your uh, so that that doesn't get disappearing. Since since we are live still, uh, I got questions of people that are watching the YouTube if they can get uh, Grasshopper. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't know what are you planning to share. Uh, for the for the we will share some in, some instructions for the the ones that are auditing students. We will share some instructions. But uh, yeah, I'm yeah, not sure. It's exactly. up to you. I I, yeah, I don't think we're gonna set up like a, what we really want to do, and that's kind of like more related to the last question there. Like is to do more of these uh, occasionally. And uh, like uh, you know, get you all involved in in a more community-based approach rather than putting out like you know you know um, resources and like we I, we believe more in the inter, in, in the interaction of people rather than, than just yeah. We'll see. We'll, we can't say exactly what we're gonna do. Yeah, also, we'll remind, I mean, I will do that when we come back because we're having a break. But remind everybody to send images for the digital futures. Guys, I'll be right back. I'm going to take actually a three minute break. It's okay. I can, you know, I can stop talking. These eight people on YouTube will not miss me that much. Someone else might take the. Oh. <laughs> you want to continue like this discussion with your, you know, with yourself? No. They already miss you. Don't go. <laughs> Again? They already miss you. They already miss me. No, I saw you holding the microphone, so I thought you would say, you would say something. I'll be right Nine people still didn't complete the poll. Let's. We have all our participants. Do you often participate in such kind of workshops that go over a few days? Or was it for many the first time or? Yeah, sometimes. Um, not super often, but yeah, sometimes for a very particular aspect or very particular skills. Yeah. Like, I mean, for example, when the last work has been like basically around machine learning and this kind of thing. It's kind of very particular techniques. Did you organize any of them? Pardon? Did you organize many, many workshops for the year? So, um, I think there are no concrete plans up to now. No, not yet. Maybe someone teaching in uni. Narit, you could answer the question of Mateus. Um, I, it's up to you, Angelos. I definitely could get it to the auditing students. Yep, we will do that. Okay. Yeah, so I think I think they call the you know the notebooks and things. Yeah. Yeah, we can share the notebooks. We will we'll, we'll send an email to the all the auditing students so that they can follow this again, like, because I understand some of them were not like really, could not like completely attend all the time. Yep. Cool. I need 10 more, uh, nine more answers here. Unless people think that they do not answer because they're not. It's anonymous. 
<laughs> oh well, I'm not. I'm not. Not. I, I'm not answering. But uh... Uh, someone cannot vote. Leah? No, that was. Oh, no, no, that was before. Uh, done. I guess we're done. Yeah, from the participants, probably we are done. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, the audit, the auditing students could also like participate if they want. But uh, yeah. So, should we restart now? Slowly. No? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think we're good. Good to go. We're good to go. All right. So hi to the 12 people on YouTube uh, again. <laughs> uh, I'm enjoying this clearly. Uh, so <laughs> first of all, uh, from my side, uh, in looking at the presentations, I think that what you guys have achieved like within like four or five days is really beyond what we expected, to be honest. Like we, we didn't really expect to reach that level because I think that it's very, very like short in, in like, you know, when a machine learning model like needs, needs a couple of days to be trained, then <laughs> there's not much room for trial and error in, in four days. Like you can only do it twice. But anyway, uh, I, I believe we've done some really good work and we've uh, achieved like some really some really impressive results um i would like to invite you to like create an open discussion here and our goal is also to like you know the reason why we're doing this is uh is also to bring together some kind of community that we can you know we can come back to these kinds of like you know meetings or events like or like you know uh, you know, in, in six months, you come back here and teach us something. And that's the idea. We don't, you know, this is not a, just a promotion event. So we are trying to build a community. And, and I'm really happy to see that a lot of you would actually like to have that more often. And, uh, you know, the collective response I get there from like number eight, uh, question number eight, would you like to attend an event like this more often is, yes, uh, we should do that. So we should organize that and we will try to do so. So... I am going to end the poll now, and uh, I will share the results with everyone so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. So we can use these uh, questions to start a discussion. So how did you like it? Like questions, feedback, like, uh, I don't know, say something. Like for me, it was great and it will definitely help me with uh, my projects for the university and stuff. So um, I think I learned uh, a lot during this week. Great. Thanks. I'd like to hear that nay. Like uh, it's more important probably than the awesome. So, I mean, and I, I honestly mean, mean that like if you are up there somewhere and you're in the audience, perhaps, and something didn't work for you, like, we'd love to hear it. We, we want to get better, right? If everyone turns on the camera, maybe we can guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. We're not going to push anyone to say anything. Like, oh, okay. I have a, mo a model trained already. So just look at the I think <laughs> it could definitely be a member of our own team trolling us. They they do that very, very regularly. So it's uh, it's it could be. I can I have a subscription. I actually think that it was me, but it was an error. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Man. It, was, it, was, it was me, but it's like I, I was answering too quick, and then I realized that I think that I answered that question. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, it was right. no, it's okay. I can't, I can't get that information then. It's, it's fine. It's fine. All right. It is fine. Thank you. Uh, so, again, the, 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 the question between, like, you know, giving out like, you know, teaching like a webinar style, like, you know, here, here's like, write up this code, type this code, type this other thing. And like, this is, you know, a sort of tutorial versus to, versus like, you know, you get together and you do some work is what we were trying to do. And I am happy to say that you believe it was balanced. Uh, it's very difficult within like three, like we couldn't, we couldn't like, uh, let's say devote the whole week to this because we also have to do some other work. Uh, uh, 
that uh, you know that like essentially like supports our like <laughs> jobs uh, but uh, we had to divide as well like we did we did i know we packed a lot of teaching in the first couple of days and we were very aware of that we are sorry for like the blitzkrieg of of uh, machine learning <laughs> information in the first uh, couple of days but uh, we did it because we wanted you to work more on your teams any uh, any kind of like uh, any kind of like um, feedback on that Yes, can I make a suggestion? Oh, yes. I have an idea. Uh, when I'm organizing sometimes this kind of courses and you have like many different things to cover, maybe it's interesting to give an overview and when you have like many different things to teach, like maybe a split the session, like who can be interested mostly on on exploring further about uh, reinforce, reinforcing learning or who can be more interested on computer vision things. And this is a great point because that's exactly what we had designed. Uh, we had designed two tracks and uh, more like a picks to picks tracks track and the and the uh, mask our CNN uh, track, I think. And then we kind of like decided, no, we should like show everybody everything because then it's possible that someone hasn't seen a certain model that they would like to apply or it was a tricky decision. So, but like really, really nice to hear that because it was one of our on our thoughts. Uh, Narit, Yosha, you want to add something, please? Yeah, I think it's great to get this feedback now because we're really unsure how, how to do it in this yeah, place. It's good to show like four models and everything, everything uh, to everyone, or would it be better to maybe focus more on one or two models and take more time to go through examples together and um, yeah, we'll work through them in more detail. Yeah, and especially because it's it's a difficult question to ask you guys, the participants, to choose one of these two tracks, knowing that you're opting in to miss out on one of the tracks, you know? Uh, so uh, we absolutely agree that this might have streamlined the teaching process, given you more time to do group work. But um, yeah, ultimately we landed on this here. We really appreciate the feedback though. Yeah, really, really uh, a lot. But on the other hand, uh, for people who we are not that uh, into machine learning, I think what was really good, and I, I, I agree like with what have you said before, uh, however, um, it was also very good to be exposed to many different uh, ways of going with that, not only for the project, but also to understand what is uh, in the field, um, or else we, we don't know. Maybe first, it's better to have this thing one day of just being exposed and then decide. I, I wouldn't be able to decide beforehand anyway. And I would feel like there are two workshops and I'm missing out. Yeah. That's exactly the... So I like it as it was. <laughs> this is exactly the, yes. day, the dilemma we had. So, yeah. yeah. I think uh, I got uh, more than I expected with in this um, manner. And also, we saw everything, so we can imagine workflows that we combine different uh, types. I, yeah. I ended up doing something else that I was I wanted to attend, but uh, I think I I benefit more. I think it helped a lot that you know the way that you set it up. You know, you went through the different. Um, the different processes but then on the first day you actually said okay you know these are all the things that we're going to go through but here are some potential uses for you to look at as teams i think that was a really great springboard i think without that you know you could we could go through the examples on monday and still come out of it thinking okay i'm still not quite sure what to do but because you know you planted seeds of potential applications I don't think any of those seeds were actually used all the way through, but it actually helped start the conversation. So that I think that worked really well. Oh, thanks. That's that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I also agree with that because, <clears throat> like, we did like uh, so at the start of this uh, call or workshop, we didn't know what we were going to work on, so it would be hard to like choose a track, and then you would have already to be very clear about the project and so. So this the setup. I like the setup. It was like setting up the project and then deciding on which technology you want to use, or which approach, and 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 also that it's uh, it was half half like that project work because elsewhere you would have seen like if you it was just like showing all the different stuff, you would have ended up like okay, 
theoretically you know how it works, but then all the obstacles you have to overcome when applying it. So it was really, really um, a well balanced between practical experience and theoretical background. So compliments on that. Great, great to hear that. I'd like yeah, to add something. Sure. No, no, go Please ahead. Go, no, no, go, 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 go. Uh, I, I really agree with uh, Edward uh, in, in terms of, for me personally, I think this this uh, gradient between plug and play and do everything yourself. And I think just having it right in the middle, I think that was a good balance of, well, everything isn't just out of the box, but uh, you kind of get a peek behind the scenes and it's just enough to to pick which direction you want to go in. I think that was really good. Great, great to hear. I'd say, um, sorry, I'm just coming in on a slight mm -hmm. tangent and I it's a, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it, it's more of a challenge that I don't know the answer to it, which is the nature of, you know, remote group working. And I'm not in no way complaining about my group. My group was awesome. Um, and like, you know, the, the, the project we came out with was amazing, but actually the nature of the technology being used is that there's a lot of reliance on just individuals to actually to actually do it. You know, I think, um, you know, we were all talking about Edward's computer crashing yesterday and we were just kind of sympathizing from afar. Um, but it, it, it is the nature of the technology. You know, you want to work yeah. in groups because it's a hackathon and it's the way that you, you know, you generate ideas and it develops. But the technology itself is quite, um, you know, exclusive, let's say. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't even know if it's a question, but you know, it's a challenge. But this is, I think this is a great, this is a very, very interesting point and like an, a bit of a, a kind of like upfront explanation on, on our side on why we did this. So we were faced with, like, you know, we have 24 uh, uh, people who want to attend this workshop and we actually like uh, capped it to 24 because we really didn't, we could not like, you know, include more people. We thought it was already too much. And we had like a full workshop. And then we thought if we allow everybody to work on like the, the easiest, you know, kind of like option is like everybody works on their own, you know, you do your own project. But we would not have enough time to give feedback to uh, everyone. And it, it's like really not a nice way to teach from our side if you don't at least provide certain amount of feedback for every, you know, for every project. That's why we decided we were going to do groups. And we are very we were very aware that you know it's the exact opposite of what like this is about this is like you know looking at my own pc like you know like doing you know um let's say training my models and like you know cutting off from the rest of the world for like three days that works better but we didn't want that and i think you guys i have to say like we were really really nervous with that like we were not sure how it's going to work if you're gonna like figure it out, if you're like you know, gonna split up afterwards in individual projects, oh, I wanna do this or I wanna do that. But you actually did like really, really well. So we're really happy about that. Uh, but it was a challenge, it is a challenge and we are thinking about it still. Can I build on that question? I was wondering like, what would it take? Because there is, there is a nice feeling of gratification is justified. You did a very good job, you finished, it feels nice, right? What does it take to keep that going? Because the typical thing that happens after this is like, I can send you all an email and say, wonderful job, let's do something else. Let's do a hackathon or another weekly or monthly, bi-monthly, yearly thing. And what typically happens is some of this falls off. People have jobs, they have real life, right? What would it take to participate in another event like that? Is it, for example, like what Andy said, it's very important. If the technology was there to collaborate, is that something that sells it for you in a, say, in a way? Like, you know, it's a cloud-based thing where you can collaborate. Or is it something, you know, uh, a more real application, you know, you find some, some problem in the world that you try to solve it. What, what, what would it take to, to do this again? You know? That's an excellent question. I want to hear the answer to that. Um, I don't know. Um, I think Again, the, the way like um, in our group, I think Leah's conversation with um, with you guys and developing that that process around you know the different steps that we could go through as part of the project, you know that actually sets itself up for either an ongoing almost thesis around this, this piece of work, or it sets itself up for a very strong piece of group work if we had you know a better grounding in the technologies. You know we could each take a section of that process and essentially plug it all together. I make that sound incredibly easy. It's not going to be. But, you know, it's that idea that 
either i mean this was almost an introductory workshop so um you know we weren't going to hit the ground running on that but you could see that if this formed part of a series of hackathons that you're, you're talking about going forward you could actually see projects develop over a year you know if you were to have a quarterly workshop in between we could be tweaking experimenting or whatever but then we come together to actually have a concerted hit on it um which could be quite could be quite fascinating. Obviously, it relies on everybody being available, you know, for those quarterly things and all of that. But that's logistics. It could also be a a more asynchronous and like uh, sort of like less <clears throat> kind of like intense uh, way of collaboration. And like I think that what we are really like that's exactly why we're having this discussion is we actually want to do this. So and you know, lessons learned are really important for that. So I want just to, to 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 follow on what Andy said. Um, so from my experience, it was like, especially for 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 formulating the idea and discussing the different ideas you have or which approach we take. I think that uh, it worked pretty well. Yeah, and then I just like it was this time. It was me just depicting one point and trying to <laughs> to get it run. Yeah, but uh, I think like. Maybe splitting up in this, because there's a lot about la that labeling stuff and how you define the labels and how you handle the data source. And that's all quite a creative process where, where uh, a couple of people can think together and evaluate and stuff. And then there's this execution part, which is heavy on managing that, that all the tech stack stuff required. But maybe you can like on a high level also split it up in this like a definition phase and first like dummy tests and then you say there is an execution bit where you go more individually and maybe that, that might be a also a sort of approach yeah. if if that's clear at all to someone. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah Peter. Ah, sorry. Uh, what, what, like, would it be something nice if there was support for the last part? Let's say, for example, you know, there is like maybe a cloud, uh, cloud instances that can do the GPU stuff and the running, and the teams can focus on the creative part. Does that help everyone? For sure, I think that like the this tutor stuff helped me a lot. Like Josh, and so I just wrote him an email, uh, a message. Do you have time for a quick call and look? I just have this particular very detailed problem and so so like having this uh, availability of someone knowledgeable to this topic you can ask and figure out this step where you cannot continue even as a group because no one of us knows it uh, how to solve it so and then you can proceed as a group again it might be i think we could also like think of it as a kind of like you know, a certain platform, like sort of platform where we discuss, like, you know, we can come up with certain projects and certain tracks that we are going to, you know, we're interested in, like, and then we can jump on, like, in, you know, like teams from those tracks of, of uh, kind of like interest and then set up like a more individual, like smaller projects from there. So, because that you know the teamwork would also is also important in in the sense of producing the results like because yeah it, i think i think we all get up we all got, get caught up in in our project work and our like you know day-to-day -day, you know like 20 meetings <laughs> 20 zoom meetings per day but but it's all we also can find that little like spot of time throughout like you know a month where we can just like put together the things. So like if we can, you know, there's like a Slack channel and then there's like more, you know, like a kind of like asynchronous communication. Like I saw you, I saw how you guys involved in the past four days in, you know, the channels and how like there was this kind of like a uh, common goal uh, for, for many of you. And then you just like try to put in uh, as much of the, of the effort as possible. So I think I'm actually really, really happy with what I, with what I hear about the, the, the kind of like steps forward and i think we can we're going to take this very seriously into account and try to set up a sort of like platform to do this uh we will definitely do that i have one question about the uh algorithmic uh kind of like uh, group 
forming. And uh, this is a very interesting, like for me, it was a very interesting experiment. And uh, I'm really happy to, I, I'm really like looking forward to, to hear what you, what you guys think, you know, the algorithm. How is the recommendation engine going? <laughs> I, th I think there are different experiences. Yeah. For example, in our group, uh, at the end, it's, uh, from four, we are now two. So somehow, I don't know if it was, but I think the problem was more logistics and time pressure than, than anything else. It worked fine. It worked, um, I think it was good. Okay. Did you feel it was more like random rather than like actually algorithmic? I personally didn't, but I don't know about the rest. Yeah, maybe we can, you can include more questions. So I don't know. Have more data in the. Yeah, I have more data. Yeah, makes sense. And, and maybe also include like the, the, the skill set. So you have like if, if there is one proficient with whatever tech stack stuff so you look like uh, an even distribution of different different skills so each team has the same yeah we did we did think about that. We, we thought about that we actually excluded the skills so that it doesn't cluster you according to skill so like it yeah no that would be the worst that's exactly yeah. the opposite what i mean <laughs> it, would take, it would take a little bit more work for us to somehow yeah, for sure. penalize, penalize the the difference it was yeah. complex than that but uh yeah we did it like a little bit like last minute so so it worked, and, yeah. Uh, and maybe also the time zone. Oh yeah, that's that's uh, um, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. yeah it's how, you, how you can find bias in the data, <laughs> like gaps? The time zone wasn't there. But yeah, like it this also is uh, works on based production. on time zone. Say it again. We chose uh, workshops based on time zone from digital futures. Yeah. So I think the thing is that we could correlate with a very nice uh, thing we could do is like make you like uh, add a point on a spreadsheet whenever you get a coffee. So then we could correlate the coffee consumption with the time zones and the production of work in Slack and the messages. And that would be actually a very interesting point to to sell to some coffee <laughs> company for <laughs> advertisement. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there was a lot of it. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe yeah, I, I, I want to also like ask. No, sorry. Did you want to say something, Peter? No, it's okay. It's just, just a joke. It's okay. Yeah. I, I, we can we can rely on my bad jokes. We can't. Don't have to. Don't no need to add more bad jokes. Like you know, it's like okay. enough bad jokes. <laughs> so the the accessibility. This is something we really care about. Like so, and Narid and Yosha like have put a lot of effort, and and Yelza and Theodore as well. I have put the least amount of effort in that, and I have to thank you all. For doing that making these models accessible like you know making like kind of like creating all the you know grasshopper scripts and like python scripts and everything to allow you to work with this and i want to hear you know what do you think like does it do you need more of that like does it need to be more plug and play like more like you know just, just give me like a black box and i'm gonna put stuff in and put stuff out like how did you feel about that i see your in your in your answers it was like uh uh wait where is it like that uh, you think it was accessible, but you need a little bit more work. And uh, what do you, what, could you like elaborate a little bit on that? I think you can't really do that for machine learning like, because it's not really a plug and play. It's, there is no big red button for machine learning that would like just press render and that's it. Uh, you. It's not machine work, learning doesn't work like that. As, especially these kind of deep learning and reinforcement stuff, they don't really work like that. So, I mean, if you really want to know what's going on. Uh... Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah. Anyone else wants to add something? I wanted to ask, uh, going a little bit back to what you were saying about collaboration and structure, um, we are, like most of us, working in different um, uh, academic settings and we do our individualistic work, but many times there are uh, things that necessitate collaboration with other institutes. 
So, or it could be that you make a call at your institute and we, we dive in. I think this is a very interesting point and uh, um, yeah, I think all universities would be very interested in, in that. We will definitely take that point, and we we really like uh, we will really uh, try to do that. Uh, you will get an email from us soon, like uh, about how we can progress on that. Any suggestions from your side? Any kind of like you know initiatives are more than welcome. Uh, this can never happen from one side. It always happens with you know many people getting involved, and we would love you know we would love this to be like the beginning of a you know beautiful friendship as per the, uh, you know, usual quote. <laughs> yeah, because what, what, I, what I have seen, yeah. what, I, ah, sorry, what I've seen. I was going to introduce today. this by saying that we've talked about it with Theodore many, many times, and we want to, ah, yeah. so like, yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is that what, I, what I've seen these few days from all of you is something like I've suspected for a while that, you know, the, the gap between like, you know, doing something is not really knowledge. It's like experimentation, right? It's just like having the means and the place and the, the opportunity to test things. And the hardest thing, in my opinion, and so far, like I've been doing this for four or five years, the hardest thing has not been, you know, the first step. That's that's really the easiest. The hardest thing is like staying in the course, you know, like not saying, okay, that was cool, and then go back to whatever normal is for everyone. So this is, you know, we would like to, you know, to be able to offer it like, if, you know, more opportunities for just to, for more people to stay the course, because from what I've seen this these few days, what you all did, you know, there can be a lot of impact just from you know from continuously applying these ideas, right? And you know, if these ideas turn out even half half to work or half as much as people want, there can be a lot of impact in the industry. So I feel this will be very fun. Can can I add something as well to the previous point, like with that uh out of the box stuff and so it would be great to have more resources even on that uh, like <clears throat> theoretical background so what's uh, what's running inside the black box but on a high level yeah so more like uh, focused on on architects urbanists designers and so and not mathematicians and so on because usually if you want to understand more of that or like the paper you sent to you there <laughs> it's nice yeah it's <laughs> but um then it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty fast goes into a lot of uh, mathematical stuff and so. And then uh, I, I uh, suspect that the majority loses an interest in digging into all the formulas and stuff like that because, yeah. So that might be also a good, good addition. And I think that there was also already some, some of this material you showed, like with, like the car wheel stuff and so. Yeah. More, to get an understanding what's the process be, be beneath it and not actually to understand every tiny mathematic yeah. uh, bit of it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Anything else anyone wants to add to this? We will continue, as we, we said. One thing we want to add definitely is for every group, we, can, we are kindly asking you to send three cool images so that we can include them to the Digital Futures final presentation of everything and everything. And we will send them over to tonight. So if you can send them like just whenever. And then maybe please try to share what you've done, like your script or your like data or whatever, and this folder that like now it posted on Slack. We're gonna keep the Slack channel open because we are gonna try to stream that into an actual continue, continuing uh, process. And we, we are not aiming to stop this here. We actually might even invite more people here and then make another event soon, where it's going to be like just a, you know, catch up, what's up, what news, what can we do, what kind of challenges there are. And then maybe from there, we can kind of like form more, more of like a team of, of core team of people who actually want to, to do this more actively. And by more actively, we don't mean like we need like eight hours per day, but we can, you know, if you are committing, committed to like just, you know, just try a little bit to uh, distribute, like uh, uh, to kind of like dilute your knowledge to others, etc. So 
I think it's a great, it would be a great initiative. And we will see. It might die off as a lot of, uh, of these uh, efforts do many times, but it might also not and end up like being something nice. After all, lots of like lots of the, the things that happened in, in the architecture industry, like for example, smart geometry started off as like something like that. It was a meeting in New York with a few people coming together, like wanting to, you know, chat about like complex geometry and ended up being one of the biggest events uh, in, in the AEC industry. So I, I witnessed a lot of them happening like that. So I would be very happy to, to try to do that. Uh, from my side, I'm going to close it by saying, yeah, I mean, send us all these files if possible, so because uh, you know, we still can can uh, like show the work. Most importantly, thank you for all the amazing uh, work you've put together and like the time you put together. You're all like super busy with a lot of other things, and like you know, we're really really proud that you took the time to to work. Uh, um, Edward said, "Ah, oh, here asking you a thing." Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you to all of you and big thanks to uh, the CIL team who actually put all this effort together to, to do this. Uh, big thanks to Yelza, Ari, Yersa, Theodore, and everyone who, who contributed. And uh, we want to see you again very soon. So like, a, you know, let's not do like a sad goodbye thing, but it's going to like be more like, you know, see you soon. See you soon. <laughs> Anybody else wants to add something, guys? Well, just thank you. I think I had a lot of fun with this workshop. I'm really glad you, you liked it. And uh, we all learned something out of it, I think. And if you have more questions to models, I think you can still post yeah. and still work on that. Yeah, yeah the, the, the channels are still there. Like, you please keep on working on them. And like, you know, we know that people are still like training models, so we can we can keep discussing that we can always jump on a call on another like you know another moment as they do I was also suggesting like you know and, and discuss some things let's keep it up okay any last words from you guys thank you very much thank, thank you, you so much thank, thank you thank you thank you, and thank you to great experience the jury thank you yeah yeah thank you all thank you Asa. thank you guys for inviting us as well and congratulations for the great work thank you for being here Thank you for the feedback and thank Thanks. you for were here before. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. And thank you to Monique for the comment. Thanks, thanks, Monique. Thank you. Right, and uh, bye to yeah. YouTube fans. <laughs> huh? Uh, we can end the stream now. Goodbye to the YouTube fans right now. Uh, yeah. Bye to the you. Let's see how many how many is still here. Uh, bye bye fans. Bye bye YouTube fans. And now this is like when. Uh, <laughs> and my mom. They're still live. They're still live, by the way. Uh, before we start talking about. Uh, you know, our lessons learned and everything from our side. Let me see uh, uh, how many, I'm going to stop the streaming by saying bye to the seven people watching now. <laughs>